Welcome, everybody. Nice to see a number of uh, faces that I recognize from past courses, um, not always on genetics as it happens, um, and then a few others who are new to this. I'm not going to make this too technical, I hope, this afternoon, covering sort of some broad concepts, but we might just get into the weeds a little bit from time to time. So if there's something you don't understand, want a little more explanation, please just interrupt and ask for it. Uh, just to get us going, please remember, we have cell phones on, if you could silence them, which means I should check mine as well. And mine was on. Okay. Well, welcome to DNA Day. Today is April 25th, DNA Day. Who recognizes these two fine young gentlemen on the right? Anybody tell me who they are? Watson and Crick. Watson and Crick, yes. Uh, Watson and Crick uh, and showing their model of the structure of DNA. And the reason why today is DNA Day is because that was the date in 1953 when their paper came out in the journal Nature describing the structure of DNA. And uh, from that, in my view, a huge amount of activity has been generated, really starting off from this very point here. Um, what they said in this, and this is a copy of the first page of a two-page article, and the second sentence read, this structure has novel features which are of considerable biological interest. That could well be the understatement of the, <laughs> of the century. Uh, there have been huge interest, and it's had an enormous effect. Um, when this paper was published, 1953, there was no such thing as a biotech industry. And probably the word biotechnology hadn't even been written at that stage. I was, in fact, a kindergartner when this paper came out. And 45 years later, I was working in the biotech industry. And today, the biotech industry, by some estimates, uh, has a market of about half a trillion dollars of sales worldwide. And that in itself, in my view, might even be an underestimate. It depends on how they define biotechnology. Uh, you've probably seen on the TV the advert for the rheumatoid arthritis drug, Humira. That's a product of biotechnology. Biotechnology is used widely in the pharmaceutical industry. Anybody want to hazard a guess at the sales of Humira last year? $18 billion, $18 billion just for one product. It is the top selling product, and that's a product of biotechnology. So this has been really quite uh, monumental. So with the idea of doing a one year update, I was collecting a lot of information and was trying to organize it. And I was really not sure how to, to, to set about this. And I thought, well, what, what should we do? Well, let's put it into categories. And then the word categories brought to my mind a vision of this gentleman. <laughs> and the way he starts it, and your categories for today are DNA politics, recognition, genetic medicine, gene editing, synthetic biology, bioterrorism, ancestry and forensic, Franken food and extinction. I don't know if we're going to be able to cover all of this today, this afternoon. So what I thought I'd do was do an experiment. Let you choose the topics that you want to cover. So let's hear, to begin with, let's have a few voices. What would you like, where would you like to start? Genetic medicine. Genetic medicine? Yes. Sounds good? Yeah. Okay. Now, the next step is, do I get the technology here to work? And yes, it does. Great. Genetic medicine. The, my five R's of genetic medicine. Re-engineer. And by that, I mean gene editing. That's a whole actual separate section. That Chuck, yeah. welcome. Come in. Um, regulate, which is transcription and translation of the gene, and we'll see how that can be regulated. 
you can replace. And that's gene therapy. If you've got a defective gene causing the disease, can we replace that gene with a good copy? Can we regenerate systems that are breaking down? And by golly, we all know about systems that begin to break down with age. So can we use what are called stem cells to create or to rebuild the structures, be it the heart, the lungs, or whatever? And then lastly, refine. We have a lot of drugs out there. Can we better match the individual patient to the best drug for themselves? So we'll go through the, the, the four of them, from regulate to refine, and then we can go back as a separate section if you want and look at gene editing specifically. So under regulate, let me just do the little bit of science. We're not going to do a lot, but just to remind those who need to know, so up at the top here, we have a piece of genomic DNA. So we all know your DNA is, is very long strands of DNA organized into chromosomes. And within those long strands of DNA, there are shorter lengths, which are called the genes. And each gene controls the production of one protein. That's the basic message. There's a, there's a start signal. There's then the sequences of A's, T's, C's and G's, and then there's a stop signal, and that defines the length of the gene. So the whole genome is, is held in the nucleus. But if you think of a manufacturing setup, the, 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 the nucleus might be like the head office, where you have the blueprints. The cell cytoplasm, where the proteins are made, is the factory floor. And when they need the template to manufacture some more widgets down on the factory floor, you don't send them the master plans from head office, you make a copy and you send the copy down to the factory floor because somebody's gonna put a cup of coffee on it and stain it or whatever. So that's exactly what happens here. The genomic DNA is copied, we call it transcription, into messenger RNA. RNA is very much like DNA, it's just that it has one atom of oxygen extra in each of the building blocks. So very, very similar. So that creates mess the, uh, the messenger RNA, which is shown down here. Now, if we think about classical drug therapy, what we then do, what happens is that the mRNA then goes out of the nucleus into the cell, produces the protein, and the protein then performs its function. And if we don't like that function, we develop a drug that will bind to the protein and stop its function. Think about drugs for heart disease, drugs for lowering cholesterol, uh, think about antidepressants. They all are small molecules which bind to a protein which is causing the disease condition. Okay, uh, what is new here is the idea that we can go right back and interfere with this piece of messenger RNA. And this goes back to a piece of work by a couple of chaps, I think they're at the University in Colorado, who in 2006 uh, won the Nobel Prize for this technology. And what it is, is that within the genome, this entire human genome, there are regions which code for small pieces of RNA, and we call them S, small, I interfering RNA, small interfering RNA. And that's what these chaps discovered. And that small interfering RNA is being produced naturally all the time in our cells. And there's a natural mechanism for regulating the amount of messenger RNA present. So you, a gene is not continuously producing more protein because the messenger RNA gets broken down after a while. And so there's a whole complex which um, uh, the small interfering RNA binds to the message and cleaves the message so the protein never gets synthesized. And the question that was open was, can we actually mimic this method in the, in the form of a drug? And so here we are. August 10th of last year, FDA approves the very first drug that is working by this particular mechanism. It's for a disease called hereditary transthyretin amyloidosis, which is quite a mouthful. It's about the misformation of protein clusters of this 
of transthyretin, which is involved in the transport of thyroid hormone. And in some patients, instead of the, uh, the protein forming its uh, effective, it's a tetramer, groups of four strands come together, instead of forming tetramers like that, it forms a misfolded protein, which comes into clumps, and these gooey clumps then cause problems. They can cause uh, disruption in the nervous system, in the liver, and the eye, and the heart, and so on. This protein is made in the liver. So if we could get a small interfering RNA into the liver, we could stop the production of the protein. And that's exactly what is, they've managed to achieve with this drug. It's called patiricin, pat, patisiran. Okay. And it's the first in its class of this type of drug. So we're seeing ways now to understand the genetics of producing um, proteins, which we don't want, and that we can use a natural genetic mechanism of breakdown to uh, break down with a drug, the, the messenger RNA. So that's the first gene silencing drug that was approved last year. In terms of replacement, this is where we have a defective gene that's causing a disease because the protein that's produced from that defective gene does not function properly. And again, the question is, can we replace that gene? And there's quite a lot of work being done in this area right now. What's key is to get how to get that gene into the cell. You can make a gene. It's very easy to do that these days. You just get a DNA synthesizer, and you just punch in the codes for what you want in terms of the sequence, and it churns it out overnight, no problem whatsoever. It's quite amazing technologies now. So, we, so what researchers have been doing is using viruses disabled, so they don't cause disease, but form a nice ball into which you can insert the gene of interest and then deliver it into the patient. Now, it's not without its problems, so what we're seeing is either treating liver diseases, because if you inject something like a virus with this DNA in it, it will go first to the liver. Or you're using, treating organs like the eye, where you can directly inject the drug into the site where the gene needs to go. Or you're taking cells out of the body, like bone marrow disease. You can extract the bone marrow, add the DNA to it, and then put the bone marrow back in the patient. OK, so right now, there's over 1,000 uh, clinical studies in place ongoing. You're looking at gene therapy. So this is big. This is no doubt it's big. And uh, if you're interested, there's the link. And I'll share all the slides at the end. But you can go and just, sort, just uh, search. There's a lot of search tools there. And you can see all of these clinical studies, all the diseases that they're looking to treat with. There is actually one drug that's already approved and on the market here in the United States. It's uh, Lux Turner from Spark Therapeutics, and it's for a rare genetic defect that causes reduced vision and actually leads to blindness. There's about one to 2,000 people in the United States with this condition. So it's a small market, but it shows the principle that it actually works and can help uh, the, slow the decline in uh, loss of vision. There's another drug, uh, and this actually featured in the Valley News just uh, about a week ago. There was an article on the cost of these genetic therapies. Lux Turner costs, if you have treatment in both eyes, it's something like $500,000 for one treatment. You only, in principle, only need one treatment, but it's $500,000 or thereabouts. Um, this one from uh, Novartis. Uh, is under FDA review right now, and this affects perhaps this condition, which is uh, spinal muscular atrophy, probably affects about one in 10,000 newborn babies. Um, and then there's a whole lot of other products out there, some of which are getting very close to the final stages for Food and Drug Administration review and approval, looking at hemophilia, where it's possible to take bone marrow out from the patient, do the gene therapy, and then reinsert the bone marrow. So this is an area which is more advanced than the first one we see, and probably we're going to see a lot more of this uh, in the future. Last 
year when we when some of us were together to look at these technologies, we looked at macular dege uh, degeneration. Now this is, perhaps for this age group, is something of significant interest because it's the leading cause of sight loss in old, older people. There's some statistics up there from the uh, Centers for Disease Control on the number of people who are affected and the number at risk. And last year we saw that there's some work being done using stem cells, and we'll come to stem cells in just a minute. Uh, but now there's also uh, just uh, in the last couple of months, the announcement of the first gene therapy trials for macular degeneration. And I'll just go back for a minute. Um, what we're really targeting are what's called the retinal pigment epithelium. These are cells that here line the back of the retina and are responsible for generating the cells that can recognize light and give you your vision. And what has been discovered is that one protein, it's called, in this case, complement factor H, and it's located on, this is a representation, and we'll see a number of these, this is a representation of the human chromosome, chromosome number one, and the arrow points to where the gene is located. All these letterings are just markers for geneticists who help them track where these things are located. Uh, and the, and the, the banding is just what you can actually produce in, in the lab with the microscope and staining. But they're looking at, so this group is targeting this complement factor H located here, and this just shows that they are you know, treating the very first patient right now with this, uh, this, this approach. So we'll see how that goes in the future for treating uh, age-related macular degeneration. Um, another one with a little bit of a twist for gene therapy I think people are very familiar probably with phenylketonuria. It's a genetic disease. Uh, it's part of the screening for all newborns to see if a newborn has PKU. If you, PKU is an inability to metabolize the amino acid phenylalanine, which is part of the regular diet. If a child has this, they have to be immediately put on a special diet because if you allow levels of phenylalanine to build up in the blood, then the consequences are usually ones of mental deterioration. So, one of the enzymes that is involved in the metabolism of uh, phenylalanine is an enzyme called phenylhydrolase, or PAH. And what they've done is they've taken that gene and inserted it into a bacterium, one of the bacteria, E. coli, which is quite common in your gut. People may take probiotics, E. coli, in the form of a capsule. Often people, of course, are eating yogurts for the lactobacillus as a probiotic to improve uh, gastrointestinal health. So what they're doing here is just giving people live bacteria with this human enzyme and looking to see if it helps to break down the phenylalanine after a meal in the gut before it gets absorbed into the blood and cause problems. So that would be a kind of handy way to, to do gene therapy for those people who are afflicted with this condition. Um, and then the real breaking news from just a week ago, and this might have, if you saw this, you might have said, huh? This was about bubble boy disease, which remember these young, these, these newborns who have no immune responsiveness. And there was this several years ago now, I mean 10, 20 years ago, they started to recognize this condition and these, these very young children were kept in a sterile environment and they could only be uh, handled by people wearing gloves in, into the sterile environment. Um, what they used was the AIDS virus, HIV, human immunodeficiency virus, is the virus that causes AIDS, except that they used that in a disabled form and it's proved to be a very good vector for delivering the virus to the bone marrow of these bubble boy children. So they've only treated a few patients so far, but they look to have reconstituted the bone marrow and have produced a fully functional immune system. So that, I think, is, is great news. It's, again, it's a relatively small number of patients, fortunately, but here we now seem to have a, a very good approach for, for these, uh, these kids. Yes? How do you disable an HIV virus? By manipulating it in the laboratory. And you know, that's what molecular biology is all about now, is finding a system whereby you can get it to replicate, 
but without including its own genetic information in the virus capsid, instead of which you have, a, you have the gene of interest that you want to put in into the capsid. It's, it's manipulative work, which you know, that's what they teach you when you're doing molecular biology. Uh, okay, so within five weeks, two companies, six billion dollars invested in purchasing technology. Hoffman LaRoche, which bought out uh, Spark Therapeutics for four billion, and then Thermo Fisher, which is a scientific instrument maker, wanted to get into this business, and they bought out the company Bremer, which is involved in making the DNA to order for any particular gene therapy. So they would be able to provide a service to any one of these companies getting into gene therapy. So six billion dollars invested in just five weeks. There are people out there who think this really is going to be a game changer and they want to get part of the action. Okay, that's gene therapy. Are there any questions about gene therapy and what's happening there before we move on? Yes? Just a question going back a number of slides. Uh, when they, you talked about the cost, the astronomical cost of some of those treatments, is that the, the, uh, the company trying to recoup its R&D right off the bat, or is that the actual cost of producing these therapies? It's not, the cost of producing is, is pretty cheap. Um, making DNA, I mean, lots of labs now have a DNA synthesizer, and it's all automated. You have a sequence you want produced. It's all it's solid phase chemistry. You'll have a, a solid phase, uh, and then you have four reservoirs, one with A, one with C, one with G, and one with T, computer controlled, add on an A, add on a T, and the whole thing runs overnight, and you have your gene the next morning. So that's relatively cheap and easy to do. Um, but these are startup companies. Right? They've got angel investors, they've got early stage investors, and they're looking to recoup some of the investment, probably millions of dollars of investment. And when you've got a patient population of only one to 2,000, it's not a lot of patients. There was a drug uh, from, uh, made in Germany, approved for use in Europe, called Glybera. That was probably the one of the first gene therapies. That was priced in Europe, it never got approved in the US, at 1 million euros for the one-time treatment. And the total number of patients for that drug in all of Europe, 200. So, <laughs> you know, you have to do the math there and think, ah. Oh. So there are, I, 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 I saw the article in the Valley News, um, there are companies are now thinking about how they could price these drugs, for example, well, maybe you pay for the, it's a, if it's a single treatment, you pay for it over a period of five years. If it doesn't work, maybe you get your money back. There's going to be some lot of discussion about pricing of these things, but they are, some, they are potentially game changers. Okay? Yes? Um, how can a small edit to the gene or the cell be enough to produce enough protein? Wouldn't the original genes, which can't do it, just dilute? Any effect of it? It's a good question. Um, I, mean, I can't give you the full science behind that, but the cell has a way of shutting off genes selectively. For example, um, you may get two copy, you get you get you get two copies of every gene, right? One from mom, one from dad. The one you get from mom might be mutant, yet you don't see the disease because the gene you get from dad works just fine, all right? So the cell has a way of getting the good gene to work properly. And this, when you add gene therapy, the gene is getting integrated into the DNA. One of the challenges of this is that you can't specify where in the DNA it's getting integrated, but it gets integrated into the gene DNA and then it be does become effective. So not the very good response to your question. It's a good question. I have to get into a lot it of has comp. To be a non -regressive gene replacement. Sorry? Right. So it would not be a regressive gene, it's a non regressive regressive gene. gene? Well if you have blue eyes and brown. Oh I see. yeah, yeah, well so we talk about dominant and uh, uh, and recessive. Recessive, yeah. 
Yes. Okay. Yeah. So um, the skid, the, the bubble boys, for example, that is uh, X-linked. And if you're male, you, you have the sex chromosomes are X and Y. If you're male, you have one X and one Y. So if you get a bum gene on your X chromosome from mum, then you, you know, you're colorblind. Thank you, mum, I'm colorblind. <laughs> and that's where the skid babies get the, the defective gene from. The, um, but recessive is when you need two copies of the defective gene, one from mum and one from dad. You have dominant genes where you only need one copy and you've got the, the, the adverse effects from that dominant gene. Uh, you said there's a thousand trials going on. I know there are different phases. Mm -hmm. and, uh, these, I mean, there's only been one that's kind of. Can you give us an idea of, like, uh, what they do based on different types of drug studies? Is, uh, is this a lot of studies? That are uh, close to approval? No, it's, there's not a lot close. Are going to be the next ones in line, and they're also from this company, Spark, which is maybe why Roche looks to buy into that. They've proven the technology. So those will be the next ones. And hemophilia, the two basically, hemophilia A and hemophilia B, which are two genes in that whole clotting cascade, and they've got drugs that will address either of those. So those, that's what's coming along next. Sort of what I'm getting at is how yeah. does this compare to like drug trials? Which oh, oh, I mean, this is, this is going to be... A, yeah, there's going to be a whole lot uh, less indications coming out in the next five years for gene therapy compared to all the drugs that will get approved that are small molecule drugs, the classic drugs. So there are a lot more of them going on. I, haven't, I wouldn't even like to count how many uh, trials are actually in, this, uh, in that government database for uh, small molecule traditional drug trials going on. There's a, a, a huge number. Yeah. And there'll be early trials and late trials. First ones are indeed a very small number of patients. Um, I mean, for example, just those skid children that we saw, that'll be in the database there. That'll be a registered trial with the Food and Drug Administration. Yes? Why do companies choose a condition that so few people have to work on as opposed to a condition that is universal or, you know, that many people have? Part of it relates to, so part of it relates to the delivery, the way you deliver these gene therapies. As we said, um, there's two or three ways. One is if it's a disturbance in the liver, then direct injection into the uh, portal vein will get it into the liver where it'll then stand a chance of interacting. Or eye diseases, you can do direct injection into the eye. But the number of genetic eye diseases, number of patients with them is relatively small. But it's a way to prove the concept. Um, and then being able to extract bone marrow from the, from the bone and to treat in the laboratory in a dish and then put it back in to the patient are all ways in which you can deliver these, these larger molecules. A lot of work has been going on for many years trying to find ways to deliver them more widely in the body, but that's still at a, an early stage. So it's really choosing, it's really dictated in part by the site of the disease and how you can, if you can get the, the, the big molecule there. Is, 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 is some, of it the, some of these very rare diseases are the diseases that end up being caused by single genetic defects? Or so that yeah, the, the number who are... Some diseases which are dramatically more complex than that? No, that they are single genetic defects. And um, it gets a little bit more complicated. For, for example, for cystic fibrosis is one gene, but it's the changes can be different from one person to another with cystic fibrosis on that gene. There are multiple sites where you could get a mutation. So that in itself presents challenges unless you replace the whole gene. 
but these are all essentially single gene diseases, yeah. Okay, uh, let's go on to regenerate um, stem cells. So we mentioned stem cells, I think, already. Um, there are three types of stem cells. There's the embryonic stem cell, and it's the sort of thing that I've tried to show here. The early stage, a fertilized egg divides into two, divides into four. Now remember that every cell in the body has the same complement of 23 pairs of chromosomes. It's exactly the same in every cell, yet we have liver cells which function as liver fu cells function and they're different from brain cells, from skin cells, and so on and so forth. Cells over time will differentiate, but they start off at the beginning of their life being capable of performing any function anywhere in the body, and only as the embryo develops do they become more specialized. They lose the ability to do certain functions, but retain the ability to do the important functions for the tissue for which they are ultimately destined. So embryonic stem cells uh, are of great interest to researchers because of this ability for them to do anything, to turn into anything in the human body. But they're also a huge political football. President Bush uh, had a, I don't know if it was by executive order or if there was, uh, I think it probably was an executive order, that prevented federal funding of any research that used human embryonic stem cells. President Obama reversed that order. I haven't followed it to know what our current president has done, but I think the money might have been on him putting it back where it was under President Bush. So embryonic stem cell research using human embryos as a source of stem cells pretty much uh, was, was struggling and people started to look for some alternatives. Now there are adult or somatic part of the soma, the body, uh, stem cells. You've got stem cells in your brain, in your heart, uh, in, your, in the fat tissue, uh, in the gut, and they're there as a sort of housekeeping type of uh, activity. Uh, as best as they can, they try, if a cell dies, your stem cell may come in and replace it in that key position. But these are cells which have already, to a certain extent, differentiated. So heart stem cells are good in the heart, but they wouldn't be any good in the brain, um, and so on. Plus, they're rather difficult. I don't think harvesting stem cells from the brain is going to be a great idea. <laughs> so, in fact, it was the Japanese who uh, a, a researcher who came up with what we now call, another mouthful, induced pluripotent stem cells. And this was taking actually a mature cell, a mature adult cell, and winding its biological clock backwards until it became like an embryonic stem cell. And from that point, you could then take it forward. And that gave us Dolly the sheep. Dolly was was cloned from, they took a, a mature cell from a duct cell from the mammary gland and they wound its biological clock backwards till it became a, like an embryonic stem cell then they're able to implant that into a, a surrogate mother and Dolly was born. So what is being done now is with these induced pluripotent stem cells. I like this cartoon, I had to just <laughs> put this in. The source of stem cells for snowmen, right? I also really wanted to make a point here because this is really very serious. A warning, I've taken this off the Food and Drug Administration page. A year ago, we, in the class that we had together, some of us had together a year ago, we looked at a number of physicians who were unscrupulous is to say the least who were recruiting vulnerable people into a clinical study. They didn't tell them it was a clinical study, but what they were doing then, they were patients who were, had failing eyesight, and they were promised that they could restore their eyesight by giving them their own stem cells, which they extracted from body fat. The result was a number of these people went totally blind. 
And so it's a big warning from the Food and Drug Administration. And if you go online and search for stem cells, you'll come across all these wonderful websites with glossy presentations about how great the therapy is and how they can really help your rheumatoid, your osteoarthritis, or your blindness, or whatever. Beware. Be very careful indeed. What the FDA suggests is that make sure either that it's an FDA-approved therapy, I don't know if they have any stem cell therapies that are specifically approved by the FDA, or that it is an investigational drug that has been approved, by a process in other words, that's been approved by FDA. The safety has been evaluated, the quality of the processes to produce the stem cells has been evaluated before they go into humans. And that's a real important thing to understand because it's very attractive uh, for some people to think that they might have this miracle cure, and it's, it's not the case. Having said that, the Japanese seem to be looking to build for themselves uh, some expertise in this area. And uh, there was, during the last year, they have uh, announced that they were engaging in three areas, very no small number of patients to begin with, determine the safety, follow them very, very closely, but in terms of eye disease, spinal cord disease, and cardiac disease. They're looking to see if they can be beneficial with stem cells. So uh, another one, another development now, is bioprinting of organs using, bio, uh, using these uh, three-dimensional printing systems. So this gentleman, uh, Anthony Atala, he, a few years back now, um, his claim to fame was that he said he was able to grow, he, he had a patient, it was a child with spina bifida, and in that child, uh, the urinary bladder was not increasing in size as the child grew, and this was causing problems, particularly kidney disease. So he says what he was able to do was to grow a new urinary bladder in the laboratory and insert it surgically into this child. I haven't looked to see the data, but People seem to think that was the case. He's now moving on, and he's trying to look at bioprinting of new organs. One of the problems is that as they grow, they collapse under their own weight. You think of a, of a urinary bladder or a heart that you're trying to print, and as the cells pile up in this model, 3D printing, eventually they collapse under their own weight. So where do you go to escape gravity? you go to the International Space Station and look out next month, a company uh, called TechShot in collaboration with NASA is gonna be sending up a 3D printer to the space station and there'll be about a year's worth of work to see if it actually functions as they hope it will in zero gravity and then they'll be open for business for printing organs. Tell you this is great stuff, you can't make it up. <laughs> and. Uh, there's a fact from CDC, about 20 people die every day through want of a replacement organ. There just aren't enough organ donors. Okay, let's look at uh, the last of the four categories, refine. And if it's in the Valley News, it's gotta be mainstream right now. This was uh, April 1st, can DNA tests help prescribe antidepressants? So what's the issue here? I took this graphic on the left here from the uh, Personalized Medicine Coalition. And the point that we're trying to make is that a number of patients just do not, the drugs do not work in a number of patients, all right? For antidepressants, asthma drugs, diabetes drugs, it's about four out of 10 patients, the drug just doesn't work for them. Uh, uh, what's this, arthritis, about half, and then uh, cancer drugs, about three quarters of the patients. I'm a little skeptical about the Alzheimer's drugs because I don't think there's too many drugs for Alzheimer's disease, frankly. Um, how does this come about? Well, it comes about because in the final stages of the clinical testing that you were referring to, we probably have 300, 500, even 1,000 patients being treated with the test drug and then another 1,000 patients being, receiving placebo. And the test, the statistical test is, did the 1,000 patients on average, average of 1,000, receiving the test drug do better than the placebo? And if the answer is yes, they did do better, 
then that drug can get approved. But it doesn't mean to say that every patient responded the same. And that's the challenge, is to find a way to get better drugs uh, for, for individual patients. This, I think, must be one of the genetic significant successes of the last 12 months. So let's spend a couple of minutes talking about this one. Women with early stage breast cancer without lymph node involvement. They will have surgery to move the cancer, lumpectomy. And then what treatment do they get next? Well, over the years, they have developed a system for scoring the genetic lesions in that cancer. If your score was high, I think the value is 30 or more, then they have done trials which show that clearly you benefit from having not only hormone therapy, but also chemotherapy. If you're fortunate and your tumor score is low, that's nine or less, adding chemotherapy on top of hormone therapy doesn't give you any further benefit. So why take chemotherapy? Just have hormone therapy. So that's great. But 70% of the patients lie in the middle between 10 and 30. And how do you treat those? Do you give them just hormone therapy? Do they have chemo as well? So the National Institutes of Health did a large study. Over 10,000 women were enrolled in this study. And those who had a score between 10 and 30 were divided at random into two groups. One group received hormone therapy alone, and the other group received hormone therapy plus chemotherapy. And at the end, the outcome was they couldn't tell the difference. This was after nine years. They couldn't tell the difference between the two groups. In other words, chemotherapy was not adding anything. So I think that's tremendous use of genetics to spare people from an unnecessary therapy. And now we've got something like 85% of these very early stage patients can just receive hormone therapy, and it's only the high, real high-risk patients at the top end of the range in their genetic score that need to get chemotherapy as well as hormone therapy. So, so if that's one uh, for women, uh, what about men? I think we all know the old saying, more men die with prostate cancer than of prostate cancer. About 80% of the prostate cancers are very slow growing and you're more likely to die of a heart disease or something else than to die of your prostate cancer. But the question was, well, those 20% that are very aggressive, why are they aggressive? And so researchers looked at it and what they've seen, and this is where, and we'll come back to this again a little bit later, is the idea that the gene is more than just that sequence of DNA that starts with the start signal you have all the letters in order, and then the stop signal. Upstream from that gene are what's called regulatory elements, which turn the gene on, they turn the gene up. It's rather like a cooktop. You've got a cooktop, right? You cook gas, propane, electric, propane. You want the water to boil, what do you do? You turn up the regulator, and then when it's boiling, you want it to simmer, you turn it back down, and that's what regulators can do to genes in a very simple sort of analogy. You can crank up the gene, and what they found here with these highly aggressive cancers is that they have become completely independent, and now they're cranking away on their own, and that's what's causing the problems. They do not, in the end, need the... Um, the androgen to bind to the regulator. The regulator is stuck up high and they're turning out the product and it can't be controlled. So here is an opportunity now for a new area of genetic medicine, focusing on not just the gene itself, which codes for the protein, but the regulators as well. And we'll see two or three other instances of that if we can get to them in the course of the afternoon. Okay. So the question is now, should we all have our genome sequenced? And I sent around a, a, a paper um, about sequencing child, children at birth. What about adults? 
So what I suggest we do is, why don't you just turn to your nearest neighbor and just spend a couple of minutes sort of saying, well, what are the pros and cons of us all having our genome sequence? And then we'll just see what the general consensus is. So take two minutes, talk to your next person and see what... <laughs> all right, what do we have? Um, somebody going to start us off with their conclusion and maybe why they reached that conclusion? Somebody brave enough? Come on. What about over here? No? What's the question? Should we have our genome sequence? Yes. Uh, we had some pros, which could be it could help your preemie kids. Uh, it may not help you short term, but maybe long term. Or, you know, if I've had cancer and strokes before, maybe it'll help my daughter or grandkids. Very good, yes. Negative, it may not help me directly, and it has a cost. It has a cost? Absolutely, it has a cost. Yeah, although the costs are coming down, it's now estimated, well, a couple of years ago, they were saying about $1,000 to do a genome, when you consider that it was, took $3 billion to sequence one genome. <laughs> Originally, the original Human Genome Project was about $3 billion. So benefit certainly to your, your offspring in terms of looking to see if there's any genetic conditions that they may have inherited from you. Uh, the downside would be the cost that for, do it for everybody else. Yeah, another one? I thought of one other. What if the insurance company gets a hold of it and denies you insurance? Absolutely. There is something that um, was uh, one of the good things that President Bush did. The Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act of about 19, uh, no, sorry, 2004. And that uh, forbids uh, health insurance from being denied based on genetic information. Now, how well it's enforceable, I don't know, but that's in the genetic information. Is there anybody else? That was a couple of good points. Yeah, sure. So we did, we've done this, we say yes, but we understand the privacy issues and one hypothetical that would be, well, let's say by some president, by executive order said all this stuff should be in the FBI database along with Right, Ab absolutely, and we saw, and we've come back to this, uh, the Golden State Killer last year. Yeah. Remember the Golden State Killer? Well, that's now, there's big stuff going on around about that. So, privacy, big issue, certainly, yes. Yes, um, I have two daughters, and the three of us did a 23andMe test because mm -hmm. it was the only one approved by the NIH and the FDA. FDA and all yeah. But a very interesting thing came, all three of us separately, if we get breast cancer, the drug Herceptin will not work for us. Oh. And I think, you know, 20 years ago when women died of breast cancer because drugs didn't help them, I think all of this stuff, one of the benefits is that they know what drug will help you and what won't work at all. So, so that was fascinating to us. you aware that I had breast cancer but if I had been genetically tested earlier, I may have been able to attack it earlier and not have an effect of chemo, radiation, etc. Cetera, right. et cetera. If you had a genetic lesion that made you yeah. more susceptible to having breast then cancer, then we we I don't think that gene necessarily makes you more likely to have breast cancer, but it says that one particular therapy would not work for you. Correct. And um, there's absolutely, yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. My wife's family, that's a family history of it. Yeah, so information. Information is great. It's very useful. Um, the, the, the good news, if you can have any good news, if you ever get a diagnosis of cancer and you end up at Dartmouth-Hitchcock, the first thing they'll do is sequence the cancer and get the full genetic sequence and see where the lesions are and what therapies might work for your particular cancer. So they're on top of it. Steve, and then we'll move on. Not strictly medical uh, side effects, but there's a, a woman who has just written a book, it was on NPR, and I can't come up with the name, but they, she did a genetic test and found out, I think we both heard that, that her person she thought was her father for her entire life, and who had died many years earlier. Was, was not her father. Yeah, 
there's quite a few. Um, there's a, there's a, there's a three-letter acronym for that, and I can't remember it, really, but not parental or something, are they? Yeah. Yeah, Don, and then we must move on. I, I would think the question would be, should I have my genome sequences? Because should we all? To me, that's an easy no. If it's just a shotgun, like everybody should have their genome. But should I, I think, is a question that is legitimate for everybody. Right. OK. Well, I'm going to give you a couple of examples and then tell you what's going on, which you can get involved in. So um, this is something from Genomics England. And they had what they call the 100,000 genome project. They enrolled 100,000 people that were in two categories. Either they had a genetic disease or they had cancer. And they enrolled a certain number of their relatives as well to get some sort of background information on the family history. And this was really helpful for the patients with genetic diseases, the rare gene diseases. Uh, they got their diagnosis for the very first time. They could say, well, ah, we found the gene and we know what that gene does. That's why you're sick. And now we can think about therapy. And that's a big problem. And that was pointed out, I think, in that article about whether or not we should sequence all newborns. And the answer suggested was, if they have a genetic disease parent, then sequence them, because it could help to identify what the disease is and then go on for treatment. The other was the cancer patients, where uh, half of them were able then to either have a targeted treatment, which was approved on the market, or to go into a clinical trial which involved a targeted treatment for their genetic lesions. So that was a real positive. Um, let's, in the interest of time, we'll skip this one. Um, talking of this testing and 23andMe, and I just have a, there's a couple of, uh, the, these things are happening all the time now. 23andMe have uh, been working very closely with the FDA and they're offering more and more genetic services and the FDA generally thinks this is a good thing, providing that genetic testing is done properly and the claims that are made are based on good science. So now you can get a test to see how your body is going to react to the drugs in terms of its metabolism. If you're taking multiple drugs, your pharmacist probably is looking at your entire list of drugs to make sure there's no adverse interactions. You produce a lot of enzymes in your liver which break down these drugs. Now, some of the, if you can take drug A, it might block the enzyme, which otherwise would break down drug B. And if there's not an enzyme breaking down drug B, the levels can rise in the body and you could have a, a toxic effect and so on. So that sort of information is important. And the Mayo Clinic now is also doing essentially a 23andMe of uh, uh, doing gene testing for you and giving a whole range of information about what your risks might be uh, about how you treat, how you metabolize drugs and so on. So it's becoming more and more common. Um, and, and people, and I, I uh, did 23andMe a long time ago, I uh, think it's a good uh, thing. So the last on this is the National Institutes of Health program. And if anybody was at the OSHA summer lecture series about three years ago, uh, Dr. Green from the National Human Genome Institute gave a presentation and mentioned Obama's Precision Medicine Initiative. And this is it here now, up and running. The goal is to enroll a million people of all types. They want you know, all ethnicities, all people of, of color, minorities, children, older people, young people, healthy people, sick people, and they want to follow your health care, your health progression over time. And they're going to take a DNA sample and, and sequence your entire genome so that they can look to see how genomes and health are interacting. And if you're interested, go to joinallofus.org and you'll get to see information on that. And you can even enroll if you wish to enroll in that program. OK, um, it's now 3.30. 30. Can we go on for a little bit longer, do another section? OK. Um, I don't know if you can read that too well. It's a bit. So uh, we've done genetic medicine. Do you, do you want to do gene editing? Yes. Yeah, OK. We'll, we'll do gene editing and see how we get to the break. Um, this was another area where we had one of the big developments of the year. And that was this gentleman here, Professor He, uh, from a university in southern China. So 
who dropped an absolute bombshell at a meeting in Hong Kong last November. He said that he had uh, done a study where he had gene edited very early stage embryos, then implanted them back into the mother's womb, and they had been allowed to develop to term, and the babies were born. And that has never been done before, and everybody has been arguing for it not to be done. So this really, and th these are the sort of headlines from the paper and from the, from the science journals about that. So what, what, what actually was, did he do? What was his goal here? The couples he recruited, a woman and a man, and the man always was positive for the AIDS virus. So here was a case, in his view, that any children born from that couple might contract HIV infection. So what he did was then, he did in vitro fertilization, obtained, and you, this is fairly standard technology now, I mean, I'm sure most of you in the room here probably know someone, family member or a friend or whatever, a younger relative of them who've uh, had a child by in vitro fertilization. Michelle Obama in her book says very clearly, Barack and I had our child by in vitro fertilization. So it's common technique, that's not controversial. But what he did was this, he then disabled one of the genes. So what we've got here, this is a depiction of the AIDS virus. This is a cell that it infects. And cells have a lot of proteins on the outside. They look a bit like tulips here, actually. Um, for the AIDS virus to infect the cell, it needs to latch on both to one of the proteins from the cell called CD4 and the other one called CCR5. And when it docks with those two proteins, then the virus is able to get into the cell and infect the cell. So what Professor He, oops, what Professor he did was to mutate by gene editing using this CRISPR gene editing technique. And we don't need to go into all the details of what CRISPR is. It's a very sexy uh, new technology that everybody is just, it's very easy to use. If you go on to YouTube and, uh, and, and, and um, a search for CRISPR, you will find kids, you know, 25 year old kids with YouTube videos showing you how to do gene editing in your kitchen. It's, it's that common, right? So he did gene editing and CCR5 with a view to being able to block the HIV virus from infecting the cells of these newborn children. Now it's known that indeed, if you have a deletion in the CCR5 gene, you will not be infected with the virus. That was found out a long time ago when they looked at Individuals who are at high risk because of the, their lifestyle and their partners, they were high risk for catching HIV, yet they never did. And eventually they figured out that these people were naturally, def sorry, naturally deficient in this gene CCR5. And I'm not quite sure what the percentage is in the population, but it exists in the, uh, certainly in people of European ancestry. And there's a couple of speculations. It may have been uh, protective against smallpox when that used to rage around you know, in Europe in the Middle Ages, or maybe the plague, but nobody's sure, and we can't go back and do the experiments, quite frankly. Um, but that's what he did. Uh, so he edited the, the, uh, the early, very early stage embryo, implanted it, and then uh, let that go to term. So twin girls were born of one mother in November, and the Chinese government subsequently acknowledged that there was another pregnancy from this trial ongoing in January of this year. We know that of the eight couples who started out, at least one couple dropped out before they got to that stage of the gene editing and the implantation. And the scientific community has been outraged and the Chinese government were probably hugely embarrassed and have severely sanctioned this guy. So, uh, I thought Bill maybe had a question, okay. So um, let's see if I can get this to work. I haven't tested the audio, so I hope this works, that we can get to hear um, from Professor He as to what he was really, in his mind, 
when he tried to do this. Okay. Well, I just need to... Well, the audio has turned up to 100%. Just see if I can. Husband's bird in the front egg. We're also sending a little bit of protein and instruction for a gym surgery. When Lulu and last month was just a single cell, this surgery removed the doorway through which HIV enter to infect people. A few days later, before returning Lulu and Lala to Greece one, we checked how the gene surgery went by whole genome sequencing. The result indicated that the surgery worked safely as intended. Grace's pregnancy was normal, which we monitored closely by ultrasound and blood tests. After birth, we again deep sequencing Lulu Lana's whole genome. This verified the gene surgery was safe. No gene was changed except the one to prevent HIV infection. The girls are safe, healthy as any other babies. We mark saw the daughter the first time. He said that he never thought he could be a father. No has found a reason to live, a reason to walk, a purpose. You see, Mark has HIV. Discrimination in many developed countries may be first worse. Employing five people like Mark, doctor denied medical care, and even forced his turn as a woman. Mark and Greece couldn't bear to bring a child into that world of fear. Mark's words told me something I didn't fully appreciate. A gene surgery that could save a child from a lethal genetic disease like cystic fibrosis or from an arthritic infection like HIV. It doesn't just give that little boy a girl an equal chance at a healthy life. We heal our whole family. As a father of two girls, I can't think of a gift more beautiful and wholesome for the society than giving another couple a chance to start a loving family. The media kept panic about Louis Brown's birth as the first AF baby. But for 40 years, regulation and morals has developed together with IVF, ensuring only therapeutic application to have more than 8 million children came into this world. Gene surgery is another IVF advancement and is only meant to help a small number of families. For a few children, early gene surgery may be the only viable way to heal an inherited disease and prevent a lifetime suffering. We hope you have the mercy for that. Their parents don't want a disabled baby, just a child, but won't suffer from a disease which medicine cannot prevent. Gene surgery is and should remain a technology for healing. Enhancing IQ or selecting higher or eye color is not what a loving couple does. That should be banned. I understand my work will be controversial, but I believe the family need this technology and I am willing to take the criticism for them. So you can learn more about our moral value and work. We will post up a few more simple videos. You can also visit our NAM website via the link below. If you wish to write Muru and Nana or myself, use the email on your screen. Okay. Right. What are we looking at? 
slideshow. Okay. So, again, might want to just. Okay. <laughs> uh, so these were the sort. Of, excuse me. Turn that sound down. Don't know what that's going to look like on the video. So these are some of the questions that uh, came up. Was, first broadly, was Professor He wrong to do this? And if so, why was he wrong? So anybody want to pitch in, Steve? I'm not sure that I. I don't, in fact, I don't think it's wrong to, to prevent. The but to test it on humans, and that's what he was doing. Let's say he was wrong. He would have then created a pregnancy that they weren't planning on having because the father was HIV positive. And if he's wrong, his technology didn't work, then he has just created a child who may very well have HIV. Uh, so I, I think the, the protocol is, is, is terribly wrong. Right. But not necessarily the results. Yeah, the question is, does the result justify <laughs> the process that they went through? Right. Yes? Well, he, he was sort of claiming that he was helping the children by giving them potentially immunity to HIV. But at least my understanding is a, a parent that has HIV, maybe they have to use IVF or some, but a child can be delivered without HIV without using all this stuff. Uh, HIV positive mothers all the time deliver HIV negative babies. I think that there, I don't know all the technology for that, but I think it's, it has to do with some sort of technique. I think they are restricted from nursing or something. Maybe, I, I don't know, maybe people know. Right. But well, I don't think they, they, they're offering the parents the ability to have a, a child by, by IVF. I don't even know if, they're, if that's impossible to do. I mean, if the, if the mother's not positive, then giving a child would give. You're saying that, that, that they're they're he's overplaying the risk, mother. right. Uh, but if right. you use IVF, the mother's not. I, I would add on to that, we d that maybe the, the question is if the, child, if the father is HIV positive and detectably so when we don't know, I don't know what's available in China in the way of treatment for people who have HIV. Here in the US, there are drugs. You can take one pill a day and you will be HIV undetectable for a long time if you take this one a day pill now. The drugs have got that effective that the, your, your chances of uh, passing on the virus to anybody else are minusculely small because the virus becomes undetectable. If you stop taking treatment, it could reoccur. But, so there are other ways to address this. Um, the, yes? Uh, we know enough about this that you can be assured that by um, eliminating one problem, we have created another. Very good. So we don't really know what the function of CCR5 is. We know how it's hijacked by the AIDS virus to infect a cell. We know that there are a number of people who have this mutant gene, and they apparently seem to survive OK. But we really don't know what it does. And it's been suggested it might be important, for example, in uh, protection from influenza virus infection or the worst effects of influenza virus infection. We just don't know. So he's knocked out a gene whose function we really don't know what, that, what the consequences of that is going to be. The other piece that scientists talk about is the safety. Is it, it's emerging that CRISPR is not as wonderfully precise as people would like it to be. Um, Dr. Professor He says he sequenced this, the, 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 the entire genome to make sure that there was no other changes and that may well be true but that's not guaranteed. Uh, the case that this, if you're talking about changing a very small number of sequences, maybe 10 or 15 out of 3 billion, the chances of it going somewhere in the wrong place are probably quite high. 
So uh, that was wrong. There's also, yeah, sure. I was saying that it's much broader than just genomic testing. It's human testing for any drug therapy. Right. There are processes. There are, there are processes, and Professor He was deliberately deceptive. He did not tell his institution what he was doing. He didn't follow the rules that require to register the study. We have, most countries, I think China we included now, at an institution you have an institutional review board. And you present your study, you present your plan, and you present all the safety work that you've done to demonstrate that it's as best you can, that the procedure you are proposing is safe and you get the approval of that institutional review board before you move ahead. Professor He skirted around all of that, didn't tell anybody what he was doing or didn't give the full truth so that people could realize what he was doing and went ahead without the regulatory permission that you normally require. So that's that. The other piece is that the scientific community involved in this as a whole very broadly is um, has said we should be very cautious about doing this type of genetic engineering. Uh, we need to know a lot more about it before we start to play around with human embryos beyond 10 days old when they should be killed. I think that there's a 14 day rule. If you have human embryo cells, you're working with them in the dish, in the laboratory, they have to be destroyed after 14 days. So what's the risk for the children? Well, so we said, maybe we don't know what the risk is with CCR5 gene. We don't know if there are other genes that have really been in fact uh, damaged by this CRISPR. Uh, the risk for the technology, I mean, this just seems almost like a trivial question, but you know, it's gonna, people are gonna be now thinking, well, what the heck have we let our scientists loose with that they're going to start, and, and there's more to come from China in a minute, by the way, which you might find a little disturbing also. Um, and then the issue of, well, can regulation really work? Somebody is always going to go around the regulations. Um, this is a map, and I'm afraid the projector's not giving very good color, so you might not see it too well. Um, but there are, I guess there are five levels of regulation, the fifth one being no regulation whatsoever. So some countries, uh, actually prohibit, this is what we call germline modification. So the changes that you make is going to be in that child and that child's child and that child and on and on and on. And so in Australia, for example, Canada, Germany, South Korea, it's absolutely prohibited by law. Um, there are strict guidelines for doing certain types of germline modification in places like China and India. United States only restricts it by saying you can't do it using federal funding. Uh, in the United Kingdom, it, they're in that category of restrictive because what they actually do allow is what's being called the three donor birth in vitro fertilization, where the mother to be has deficiencies in the other organs in the organelles inside the cell called the mitochondria, which have their own set of DNA and so they get mitochondria from another donor. A little complicated, but that means that puts the UK in this sort of restrictive category. Ambiguous, Argentina, Iceland, South Africa, and then the whole of Africa is, of course, no regulation at all, uh, or in South, Southeast Asia. But if you're in one country, as we've seen with other technologies, if, if it's banned in your country, you just get on an airplane. If you really want to, you get on an airplane and fly to somewhere else where you find a doctor willing to, to apply the technology. Bill. I was just going to say, you know, I think the only way to deal with it is to enter in an app over But the problem is lack of lapse enforcement. It is. Right. Yeah. And medical tourism. People will travel. Okay. So talking of China. Um, this is the China National Party Congress. Um, Back in 2011, as part of their five-year plan, their five-year plan was that they were going to develop uh, primates as better models for human disease. At the moment, scientists researching in pharmaceutical biotech companies, they use mice and rats for the most part, and then a few primates. But the thing with primates is they're wild bred, or even if they're captive bred. 
unlike the mice, which have been bred for generations. So you get a box of 10 mice and you can't tell one from another. They're all genetically exactly the same. But the monkeys that are used in a very few experiments uh, will be just mixed bred. And so they are going to be different, as different as each of us is here today. So what the Chinese said they wanted to do was to, first of all, to uh, develop a way of getting a more homogeneous population of monkeys by cloning. And so what we have down here is this rather a catching photograph of two little uh, baby rhesus monkeys that were identical clones of them a couple of years ago. This, of course, over here is Dolly the sheep, which was the first mammal to be created by cloning. So the Chinese now are cloning monkeys, and uh, they wanted to then to do gene editing of them. There's a gene called MCPH1 in humans, which is believed to be re related to the size of the skull. And if your gene is mutated, you have babies born with very small skulls, very small brains as a result. So the Chinese were interested to understand if this was some sort of gene that would, you could attribute our higher level of intelligence, our skills that we have as humans, uh, is this was some gene that, uh, that affected that, uh, made that occur. So they put the human MCPH1 gene into macaques, and they claim, they claim that the, those monkeys perform better on short-term memory tests. But again, this has really opened up a whole area of, uh, of and there's a paper actually, and there's, I can give you the paper if you're interested in, written back in 2010 about the ethics of involving monkeys and doing these sorts of uh, studies to see if you could, quote, humanize a monkey. Anybody see those, uh, that, uh, the, those, that photograph that went viral about a couple of days ago, taken out in Africa? It was at a, um, a reserve where they looked after orphan gorillas. The mothers were poached, killed by poachers, and they take the very, very young babies who have been abandoned as a result, and they raise them. And it was kind of scary to see this photograph. There was a keeper with his phone taking a selfie, and behind him were two adult gorillas at this stage standing up, just like humans. It was, it was really weird. It was really weird. They've been. I, I was wondering if he showed the picture of the gorillas and they knew they were. <laughs> um, so that's what they've been doing uh, in China with uh, with monkeys. But there is there is at least some good news uh, from CRISPR. Uh, this is a company, Mammoth Biosciences, by. Uh, started by Jennifer Doudna, who is one of the leaders in this, and we may get to see her a little bit later if you choose to do so. And they think that they can use CRISPR to actually function as a diagnostic test. And particularly, it's a lot easier to do for some of these viruses than the current tests, where they're done out in places where electricity supply is not as reliable, um, where you haven't got the complex laboratory set up that you really need. And it might be useful, and they're trying to develop tests for these Lassa fever, which is in, in Nigeria, it's a problem, Ebola, which is a big epidemic again in the Congo right now, and of course the Zika virus, which we've seen in South and Central America. So there is some good news, good things can come out of CRISPR. Okay, it is five minutes to four. Uh, we are scheduled for a three hour session, so we're about halfway through. If you would like to take a break for a little while, are we uh, ready to go? Yeah, sure. Where would you like to go to next? Hmm? Okay, ancestry and forensics, we can do that. I'm amazed it works. <laughs> First time I've done it, you go anywhere. In the, in the, okay. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry about the, um, the, some of the photographs, the color of this projector. So this is supposed to be bright red here and here. 
it doesn't come out quite the colour it's supposed to be. So, um, anyways, a couple of uh, pieces um, on the, our ancestry going way back, like 30, 40, 50,000 years um, that came out. We all know the story of the Neanderthals who left Africa about 400,000 years ago and spread out through Europe and parts of Asia. Um, then there's another group of people called the Denis Denis Denisovans. It's not clear whether they are a species all unto themselves, researchers haven't decided this, or whether they are a subspecies of us, Homo sapiens. But anyway, these Denis Denisovans live, were found, first of all, uh, populating a cave in the southern part of Russia, or maybe it's in Kazakhstan, but in that area. And there's a lot of evidence for people living there over many, many generations. And the uh, news that came out uh, during the past year was that a paleontologist using DNA that she was isolating from the bones found the evidence of a child whose mother was a Neanderthal and whose father was one of these Denisovans. So that sort of kind of set the world on fire a little bit, at least if you're in the paleontology world, <laughs> it set the world on fire. I don't know that it actually made the main news in the evening. Uh, this woman, uh, Viviane Sloan, if we get to that section, was actually recognized uh, as one of the most influential scientists or top scientists of the year by uh, Nature magazine. And then there was a new human species identified in the Philippines, uh, Homo luzensis. Um, they date back about 50,000 years. So the maps of the spread of the homonyms, our species, the Antals and so on, is forever changing as they find ah. more and more, bless you, more and more um, evidence of these people emerging from Africa and spreading across the world. Um, just changing a little bit, this is uh, an early settlement. Uh, this is uh, a collection of bones that were found uh, from the early, from Neolithic period, our, our species during the Neolithic period. And in that period, they, th there's good evidence that humans gathered together in Europe in very large settlements. And then all of a sudden, these large settlements appeared to just disappeared and people then began to live in very small isolated communities and while they were looking at all of these uh, remains from this one of these communities going through the DNA they came across a new strain of plague and now the hypothesis is still a hypothesis by no means proven maybe that a new variant of plague emerged and swept through these large communities where people living closely together, of course, it would just spread very easily. And so human evolution and human distribution has been affected by, um, by microorganisms and infection. On the right here, this was just using uh, a, a marker of a virus, hepatitis B virus, actually integrates its genome into your own genome in the liver when you're infected. And they actually use that as a marker to trace the migration of early peoples through Southeast Asia and into uh, Australia. So some interesting little techniques uh, being used to uh, uh, look at uh, our early history. Okay, DNA forensics. I think somebody mentioned the, one of the issues about having a cell sequenced is that, of course, what happens if that information then falls into the wrong hands? Um, when we had this, when we were together, those who were with us a year ago, of course the Golden State Killer just hit the headlines about two days after our, the start of our course. I couldn't have planned it better if I tried. <laughs> it was wonderful. Um, and that case you'll remember they had, it was a cold case, they had lots of forensic samples from uh, the, the past murders and rapes, so they, they, they had lots of DNA samples, but they had no idea who the killer was. And what, they, what the FBI did was to go to one of the public databases where human DNA sequences have been uploaded by their owners. 
So you've done it knowingly that this is a public database. This is not 23andMe or Ancestry, which are closed, should be closed databases. This was a, an open database. And they looked in that open database and found a third cousin to the forensic samples that they held. So then it was a matter of, finding, of identifying that individual in that database as, as a human, what their names were, where they lived and so on, and mapping out their family tree. And that gave them probably a thousand or more possible suspects for the cold case. And they gradually whittled it down and whittled it down until they found the one person whose DNA matched the forensic samples. And they've solved at least 12 more cases uh, now in the US, it's been done in France as well. So this is becoming an established technique. What's interesting is that somebody, some academics now, have gone and figured this out and said if there were three, just three million samples on a public database, we can identify 90% 90, 90 of Americans of European ancestry from what's in a database of three million. Right now, uh, there's, there's about a million people have uploaded that information into the uh, GenMatch Gen uh, database. If there were three million there, FBI could track down 90% of their relatives. So it's a very powerful but slightly scary technique. <laughs> yes, done. So this is uh, something called GED Match, and it's just an open database. You know, you can go to it online and read off the DNA. People want, want to find ancestors, want to find relatives, and so they're uploading their DNA. Anybody got DNA that matches mine? Well, that's where it is. It's different from 23andMe. 23andMe will say, and they send me emails all the time, we found a fifth cousin of yours, you know. <laughs> okay, fine, nice, thank you very much. <laughs> Moving on. But this is a public database that anybody can go to. The big question, of course, is can people like the FBI go to these supposedly closed databases where we think we've given our sample and it's to be protected? So that's the question. Steve. Just a very current application is the uh, issue in Vermont right now for uh, testing for marijuana. But the governor said he will sign a bill and only if there's a saliva test uh, given <laughs> Hold, hold that thought about giving DNA. Yes. Whoops, sorry. Uh, we'll come to that in, uh, in just a minute. So this whole DNA piece, though, is really, you can really tell now it's in the public conscious. Because here we have a Dilbert cartoon. I don't know if you can read it from there. Uh, did you leave unwashed dishes in the break room? Wasn't me. I got a DNA sample from a fork and ran a test. <laughs> OK. <laughs> That sounds like Switzerland to me. <laughs> okay, so there we are. D Dil Dilbert is now dealing with DNA testing as well. Who's heard of the Rapid DNA Act of 2017? Well, surprise, none of us have heard about it. The reason why it's in this is because it only became effective on the 1st of January of this year. So I felt it could get a place in it, because why is it important? Under this act, approved instruments can be used to test a cheek swab from a suspect in police custody. It takes 90 minutes to do a specific type of DNA sequencing. It's not sequencing the whole genome, but it's a very specific t testing of certain regions of the genome. That takes 90 minutes. And then that readout can be checked against the FBI database. So you've got a suspect, there's some forensic samples from the scene that have been tested by the FBI, because that's really specialist testing, forensic DNA from a crime scene. But in 90 minutes, you'll get a readout as to whether or not that person you have as a suspect was in fact related to that crime. Does it require a warrant? Uh, well. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll get rid of this, Steve, for you. Right? No problem. I'll, I'll get rid of it. <laughs> Got your DNA. But here's the other side of this coin. Sounds great, right? Make life easier, solve all the crimes pretty quickly. But what's the other possibility? We find somebody acting suspiciously, drag him off the streets, take a DNA sample, and then start searching through the FBI database for a crime that he might have committed. Does, does it go to the database? Does it have to access? If you're exonerated, is it still going to the database? It's still in the database. Yeah, they, I think my sense of this is, is once it's in the database, you're in there forever. Yeah? I mean, I'm sure. Checking and this negative and no, away. no, no. And, and the, 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 part of this was written up in the New York Times at the beginning of the year. And the uh, police forces which have started this are now, especially in large urban areas, are themselves creating their own database. So they pick up somebody off the street, get a DNA swab. Ah, oh, wait a minute, you, you got your DNA from you know, that uh, break-in uh, three months ago. Or it's familial. Hmm? That's it can be familial at that point. Uh, well, I think the DNA fingerprinting is sufficiently exact science that the chances of it being even a family member are, are, are reduced. But what I was thinking, though, if you've got your DNA sample got in there, and they ran it through the database, and they can see that you are related to this other person. Oh, yeah. Well, then they have, yeah. well, maybe they're going to have to I just don't know if you can catch something. <laughs> OK. So, but, so there's, I think there's a big risk here. And we all know, unfortunately, at the moment, still in this country, that people of color are more likely to be stopped by the police than somebody who Caucasian origin, and this is a route, I think, to, you know, again, discrimination against people of color, getting more arrests and finding crimes that they might have been involved in. So, not a happy uh, approach. Uh, yes, by the way, the, the, the method of DNA testing there, it's done, done on this rapid machines and by the FBI, is different from what you get from 23andMe and Ancestry, so there's not that sort of crossover, because it's a different part of the genome, different way that they're looking at it. So that's one small consolation. Say fingerprinting? Sorry? Isn't there a database of fingerprints that are on those? Yes. Individuals? Yeah. Well, it's a lot easier than a, a fuzzy fingerprint. Uh, this is a very exact science and relatively easy to do. And to get the match, it's easily digitized. Um, and we're shedding DNA all the time on our coffee cups and everywhere else. Okay, so this is actually being used uh, also uh, in Canada. They have a couple of three cases. They have individuals who came to Canada seeking asylum, and then unfortunately they became involved in crimes. And so the Canadian authorities have said, we are no longer allowing you asylum. We're going to send you back home. Yet the country back home says, oh no, he doesn't belong here. What's the evidence that this gentleman actually came from Nigeria or from the Gambia or from wherever else? So what the Canadians are now trying to do is to take DNA samples and figure out the nationality of these people so that they can be deported back to their home countries. Okay. Where do we want to go? That's all we got for that. Not a lot happened. Yes, Don. That the fingerprinting thing, I think there's been uh, information recently that fingerprinting isn't as, as accurate as it was always assumed to be. Absolutely. And I'm just wondering if we aren't in an infancy of this particular technology where that same thing might be found out with DNA now. So the uh, DNA fingerprinting was developed back in the late 80s, I think, by the, the, the Jeffries in Le University of Leicester in the UK. Uh, I think it's been fairly strongly established, but never say never, I guess, you know, I'm sure there are mistakes. There was the person on, on the hand fingerprints, you know, the regular traditional fingerprints, the person who was arrested in the state of Oregon for committing a, uh, uh, some terrorist act, and eventually he was able to convince the police that he was not at the site of the crime, and in fact there was another, because his, his, the print was only a partial match, it was in fact another person in Spain who committed the crime. But this person who perhaps had a Muslim 
background was in real trouble for a while until he was able to prove that he was innocent, which is not the right way that it should be. Yeah. Is one of the upshots of all this that, that it is maybe inevitable that our DNA is in a public database for everybody? I don't know. Uh, possible. Um, my fingerprints are probably in the FBI database, not because I committed a crime, but when I applied for citizenship, I had to give fingerprints. And now, you bet, they're in the database somewhere. Somebody's got them. And there's even more use for DNA than yeah. there is just fingerprints. Well, the other thing is facial recognition. We can't protect ourselves from having a camera no. take our picture. And, and it's getting to the, a level so Well, wasn't it impressive in the UK when they found the, the track, those Russians who came in and went to Salisbury and poisoned the uh, Russian general, whoever he was, who defected from, from Russia. Uh, they tracked them all the way through the system, from arriving at the airport through the railway station into Salisbury and then heading back again, all through facial recognition. And all the There's a lot of cameras around in the UK and in China as well. Yeah, right. Oh, yeah, right. Yes. Um, I'd like to look at having your um, DNA tested if you were stopped by the police and not to look for you as a potential criminal or something like that, but to find out that you don't match anything and that would be positive for you. Yeah, it, it, it's, so there, there are two sides to it. Absolutely, uh, that you can be exonerated, although, you know, it's always a negative is, is doesn't mean to say that you weren't involved in the crime also, it may be the, the other, somebody else with that DNA, but I, mean, I think I take your point. It, it, it certainly has some strength to it. Okay, uh, where do we want to go? Synthetic biology. Mm, synthetic biology, okay, we can do that. Okay, for all the potheads. <laughs> um, Cannabidiol, it's a ca complex chemical extracted from the marijuana plant. It's not the bit that gives you the marijuana high, but it's just been approved by the FDA for the treatment of certain forms of epilepsy. Now, there's a lot of interest now in the properties of these cannabis, we'll call them cannabis compounds, uh, aside from getting a marijuana high. And, um, of course, up until now, what has happened is that you have to grow the plants, and that's always a high-risk strategy, and harvest them and extract the chemicals because they're fairly complex for synthesizing. So some resourceful chemists out in California, where else, have actually managed to transform yeast, brewer's yeast, so that starting with a simple sugar, galactose, they can produce this cannabidiol or even tetrahydrocannabinol and get a high if you want that as well. That's quite a feat of genetic engineering, taking 16 modifications, gene modifications to a simple brewer's yeast and able to produce this material in quantity. So it, it's certainly a path now to allow for a greater supply of material so responsible people, hopefully, in the pharmaceutical industry can really examine the effects of these compounds and see if there are other therapeutic benefits to be had. Um, ah, chicken technology. Here's a couple which I'm less certain about. They made transgenic chickens, which when they lay their eggs, the egg white contains specified proteins, and we have a number of proteins now which are drugs. Um, antibodies is one, but things like EPO, uh, epigen for stimulating red blood cell production or neupogen for stimulating white blood cell production, human growth hormone, interferon, these are all human proteins. And they can engineer them into the chickens and all you need to do is to take three eggs and you extract the protein from it and you've got one dose of drug. Um, they say it's inexpensive to produce but I'm not convinced about that. Any eggs? Hmm? Any eggs? Well the chicken has to be made transgenic with respect to the protein and then the eggs that they lay that protein is in the egg yeah the other side of the coin we all know that talking of influenza that um, yeah it's inexpensive to feed to cost to produce its chicken feed right oh. is that what you, yeah. no, no, I said the chicken comes first. 
Oh, all right. All right. Well, the cost to produce it is chicken feed, literally. Um, influenza, this is on the top part of this graphic, it shows the life cycle of the influenza virus. And I think we've all heard about influenza pandemics in the past and how we get these uh, new variants of influenza occurring. Um, there's, you'll see in a moment, uh, the influenza virus has little spiky proteins on the outside. One is called HA and another is called NA, and those are varying all the time. So the current virus going around is one called H3N2, and another one is H1N1 that are going around. And these have been strains that have been going around for a long time, but new ones keep emerging in China. And this is the sort of life cycle that they go through. The virus uh, is in the uh, in shorebirds, waterfowl. It gets into a domestic chicken and then it gets into the pig or goes straight into the human. And there's a lot of concern that we haven't had a major new pandemic strain of virus for a long time, but it must be coming sooner or later is the real concern. What the scientists have done is to take the chicken genome and CRISPR gene edit it so that actually the chickens are resistant to all of the known influenza viruses. So all they've got to do now is replace all the billions of chickens in the world and we're in great shape, right? So that, that gets some sort, of, some sort of carrot award for the year for not very useful science in my book. Um, but talking of influenza, so this is a little model of influenza. These are the little spikes on the outside of the virus, the hemagglutinin HA and the neuraminidase NA. And our antibodies, which give us the immunity to the virus when we have our vaccine shots, the antibodies are to the very tips of each of these proteins. And the reason it's only to the tip is because the antibodies are pretty large molecules and can't squeeze down and get to that stem part of the, of the protein. And that stem part is highly conserved. So guess what? Llamas. Who would have thought? Who ever thought of studying antibody formation in llamas? Well, it turns out llama antibodies are very small. They're only a tenth the size of human antibodies, and they are sufficiently small that you can actually make antibodies to this highly conserved region of the stem of those proteins on the outside. So if we've got a way of producing antibodies, in ourselves, maybe we can make ourselves immune to all strains of influenza virus and we won't have to go get our shots every year. Well, uh, so far, they've certainly they've cloned uh, llama antibodies and shown that they will bind to all strains of influenza and they've treated some mice with the antibodies or given them ge uh, gene therapy up the nose and they're resistant to uh, influenza. So, I don't know. Who knows? Some of the exciting things that scientists do these days with, um, with, 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 with genes and so on. Right, where do we want to go to next? Sorry? Oh, Frankenfood. All right. Yeah, good one. Ah, labeling gene edited food. So who's got a definition for me of genetically modified organism? Maybe we'd like to come up with a definition of a GMO. I mean, we all talk about we don't want GMO foods, we want organic foods and so on. But what do we mean when we say a GMO food? Yeah. Well, like Monsanto makes seeds that are resistant to certain diseases. Right. And how are they made resistant? They gene edit them somehow. A bit more detail. Maybe none got that. What they do, so we were talking about Roundup resistant soybeans or Roundup resistant corn. What they put in to the corn or to the soybean genome is a bacterial gene, which makes it resistant to Roundup. And that, to me, is a good definition of a genetically modified organism. You're importing a gene which would no, never normally get in to a plant or to an animal, because it's from a totally different species. All right? So that's one modification, that's one definition of genetically modified. Is there a uh, standard definition? I mean, is there a, like a, you know, no. regulatory no. definition? No. And we'll, we'll just see in a minute how they're all over the place with, with these definitions. Yeah? That would be a relatively benign thing, but what if you modify your corn so that it can't be planted again? 
Yes, they, they may be. They, that, that's, that's, a, that, that's what the uh, Monsanto and so on want you to do, absolutely. So a couple of three years ago, it's a company down in Massachusetts called Aqua Bounty, I think they're called, and they produced a monster salmon by taking, by doing gene editing, taking genes, including, remember these upstream promoters that we talked about, the regulatory regions upstream that can switch a gene on. So they took a regulatory sequence from one species of salmon, and they took a gene from another species, and they took a bit more from somewhere else, and they put this all into one species of salmon, and were able to produce very large salmon with great efficiency. And Congress said, whoa, wait a minute, particularly um, Senator from Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> Before this could be marketed, they said the FDA and the Department of Agriculture has come, got to come up with ways for labeling these foods which are created by genetic editing rather than just the GMOs or now on top of the GMOs. So this is the FDA's response here. For the, Euro, if, uh, for the United States. Um, and this is on their website. First of all, they're taking, I think it's a rather crafty approach. They're saying, well, everything has got to, it's got to have the same safety as any other food. There's actually no very specific set of tests that a manufacturer has to do to complete before food can be termed safe. They do, they come up with their own tests and the FDA review it and say, have they adequately demonstrated that this food is, is safe? So the FDA starts off with saying, well, you've got to test them like you test all other foods that are regulated by us to show that they're safe, whether they're produced as a GMO or by any other means. But then it craftily goes on to say, well, we're not aware that uh, any foods derived by these technologies would actually necessarily be unsafe or different from foods that already exist. We're not aware of any obvious safety risk from doing gene editing or GMO, but you've got to do the testing. But we're not taking a position because we don't have any data, FDA, to say that these, uh, all these plants created by gene editing would be unsafe. Okay, then we got into labeling and the labeling confusion between FDA on the one side and the US Department of Agriculture on the other. The FDA said if a G food is derived from genetically engineering plant is materially different from its traditional counterpart, then it must be labeled showing those differences. And they gave some examples. There is now uh, canola oil, which is high in a particular fatty acid, lauric acid. So that has to be labeled lauric canola oil. There's high oleic acid soya bean oil because the levels have been boosted by engineering. And there's a, a soya bean which produces a fatty acid, stereo, stereodonic acid, which is not found normally at all in soya beans, so that's appropriately labeled. That's the sort of labeling that the FDA wants to see, where it is substantially changed from, uh, the, um, uh, from, the, from the original, but not necessarily implying that it's unsafe. It's been tested for safety and found to be safe, but it's just highlighting what the differences are. Uh, and then they provide some suggested wording for how, if you're a manufacturer, want to emphasize that your food has not been subject in any way to genetic engineering, here are some words that you can use. The, FD, uh, the US Department of Agriculture has its uh, National Bioengineered Food Disclosure Standard, and they say that they have to label the foods as containing genetically modified, which is what I tried to suggest might be a definition, having a foreign gene in it, or a bioengineered ingredient. And they then provided a list of foods which would be uh, exempt from that labeling of being bioengineered, and that's if they'd be modified uh, in the laboratory uh, in a way, sorry, these are not exempt, the ones that had to be labeled is if you couldn't have done that by genetic, by, by traditional crossbreeding. You think about crossbreeding and the huge genetic diversity that, we be, that humans have been able to produce. Just think about all the breeds of dogs that originally came from a wolf. 
I mean, it's huge genetic diversity that you can create by cross-breeding, but it's a very inefficient process. But if, 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 if the changes that you make, you can credibly prove that they could be made by cross-breeding and the, the other sort of traditional genetic processes, then you don't have to label that as genetically modified or genetically engineered. And one of the things is the super salmon are exempt from that labeling, so they don't have to be labeled. And so they are on the market. They've certainly been on the market for a while in Canada, and I think they're now available in the United States. The Europeans, on the other hand, have taken an entirely different track. And this was a ruling by the European Court of Justice that they said foods which have been gene, gene edited using CRISPR technology or whatever are equivalent to what we've hitherto called genetically modified organisms. And they have to be labeled if, it, if any ingredient contains more than 0.9% of gene edited material, it has to be la labeled as that. Good luck with trying to figure out if it's 0.9% of any one ingredient has been genetically edited. It seems to me to be a little bit crazy. What they're exempting is that the, uh, plants that, or animals that have been bred using the traditional methods. One of the ways to create mutations and then find the favorable ones is to blast the plant or whatever you're dealing with, with radiation. You get mutations all over the genome, you don't know where they are, and then by a slow process of crossbreeding and selection, you end up with the desired product that you want. That seems to me to be far more risky than doing very selective gene editing. So, this was a company or a research station in the UK who were interested in engineering uh, omega-3 fatty acids, the sort that we probably take you know, in a capsule, fish oil capsules, cod liver oil capsules, good for the heart. They were, wanted to produce it in this um, uh, Camelina sativa uh, plant in the seeds, and they did it by two ways. One was to insert a foreign gene, a gene from algae, which would help produce these high levels of, uh, of omega-3 fatty acids, or by actually editing the plant's own genome so that it would naturally then produce the fatty acids. And they took this to a government review, and the government looked at all the data, and they said it would not be possible to determine whether the engineered, the gene edited version had been produced by gene um, editing or by traditional mutagenesis and selective breeding. So the, the, um, the minister responsible for food in the UK has made a ruling that where gene editing results in an organism with DNA from a different species, it will be regulated. However, if this the specific regulation of this technology is not required when the induced change could have occurred naturally or achieved through traditional breeding uh, methods. So everybody is all over the shop on this one. US versus Europe, Britain, still in Europe, but maybe for not much longer, <laughs> is in contrast to what the Europeans are requiring. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a problem that it's got to be sorted out eventually, but that's where we are with labeling right now. Yes? So who regulates uh, where these things can be in the world? I mean, so if they're say, let's say they're safe to eat and digest and whatever, but it may be you know, competition or a threat to natural species. I know this is true. Like that monster salmon probably could yeah. cause a lot of havoc in a I don't know that it is regulated. Of course, if you spend, invest a lot of money in making a super salmon, what you'll try and do, of course, is fish farm it and make, try to you know, make sure that it doesn't so, escape so, so the... So for business reasons, I know they make, they make plants sort of sterile so you can't get seeds. And sometimes yes, sometimes no. Is, is there any regulation on whether they can produce pollen that will end up mixing 
Well, there, there certainly is, we will come to uh, in a minute, plenty of evidence that uh, you know, you can, the plants can interbreed them species and acquire genes from another plant. So it's not beyond the uh, realms of possibility that you took a genetically engineered plant of some sort, put it out in the field, and its genes would be transmitted on to other plants. That's what you're saying. That, that would be, and I don't know that that's regulated. And I'm sure, on the other hand, that the, the big seed companies are wanting to sell these seeds around the world to increase pr productivity. Because for sure, there's a, a real food crisis coming in the, in the years ahead of us. There's no doubt about it. Chuck. Is No, not that I know of. So this is no. kind of a tempest in a teapot. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just an abundance of caution, um, if you like. Uh, but people, you know, people are saying they do not want to have, some people are saying, I do not want to have genetically modified, a, a food that's been created from a genetically modified organism. But all it is is a bunch of C's, G's, A's, and T's, which you're full of anyway. So it's kosher. <laughs> Isn't the big Probably the original source of the issue was in Roundup, mm -hmm. where you have Roundup ready seed. And it's not the, the seed that's the problem, it's the fact that Roundup is the problem. The, 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 it's, uh, the, plant, the thing is contaminated with a lot of the herbicide, possibly. Herbicide. But people, people are looking at it, I think, from the point of view of it being genetically modified. They don't understand if there's a risk or no risk from eating that. Talking of wheat, and talking of your um, quiz, I, I asked, you know, compared to the human genome, that of wheat is half the size, the same size, or five times the size. I don't know what you put down, but here we have it. A hundred, more than a hundred thousand genes in a wheat plant, and six billion bases. How many bases in our chromosome? Remember what I said a while back? Three billion, so it's, it's three, it's five times the complexity, and we have about twenty-five thousand genes. It's sort of going up, creeping up a little bit more as we go along, but twenty-five thousand is probably sort of a good round number. So, so what's going on here with wheat? What happened? They found, in fact, that way back when, two plants actually crossed and shared their genome. So that in a single plant you've got two genomes, which means instead of having two pairs of each chromosome, you now have, sorry, you not have one pair, but you now have two pairs of chromosomes. And then a little bit later, a third plant merged with wheat, and so now there's three pairs of each chromosome, which means hex, well, I mean hexaploid. So it's a very complicated uh, genome, uh, but scientists have, have now sequenced it. Why would you want to do that? Well, wheat production, they suggest, needs to be increased by 60% over the next six years. It's a very important source of calories for people in parts of the world like North Africa and Asia. And the population's increasing, but as the temperature goes up, the wheat yields are decreasing. They're susceptible to heat. And then, of course, we're seeing much reduced water in some places. So you now need to look for drought resistant varieties. So the hope is that using a knowledge and understanding of the wheat genome, they can now produce variants which are more resistant to the elevated temperature, variants which will survive better in a drier climate. Um, we will see you know, a traditional crossbreeding It'll take 10, 15 years before you get something that might be useful. They're hoping they can do this very much more rapidly using gene editing because there's a real cri food crisis coming uh, down the road. Okay. Yeah. No, the next question. Oh, sorry. Oh, you want to go somewhere? I can't leave those. D oh, okay. DNA politics, we haven't done. Recognition, we haven't done. Uh, bioterrorism, we haven't done that, or extinction. How about DNA, have we got some time for DNA politics? This is, um, this is a fascinating one, but a little bit complicated. Well, it's all about President Trump, right? 
These are some of the headlines when his administration started to take aim at the transgender community. Okay? Health and Human Services reporting to consider limiting definition of gender. Uh, it should really be sex. I mean, the term gender and sex you know, is kind of confusing. They're saying that whatever you are assigned at birth, that is your sex. So if you on your birth certificate says male, you are now male. And that's what we're going to consider. Um, the issue of uh, transgender in the military. So I wanted to share with you a study which is, I, I found it fascinating, complex, hard to explain a little bit, so we'll take our time as we go through it. Um, and then I want you to think about what the significance of this is. We've all probably aware with this, uh, uh, high school biology or whatever, this is the map of the human genome in the sense of showing the chromosomes. 23 pairs of chromosomes. Pairs 1 through 22 are called the autosome, and they were generally considered to be the genes that just made the body function. It defined a nerve cell, it defined a, a liver cell, a heart cell, muscle cell, blood, and so on and so forth. Then there was the 23rd pair, shown here as X and Y, which means male. If you're X, X, you're female. Very simple binary, right? XX, female, XY, male. What's the problem? All in the genes. This was the title of a paper from some Australian scientists earlier this year. Human sex reversal is caused by duplication or deletion of core enhancers upstream of SOX9. So let's dissect that out a little bit. Again, we come back to here's the gene. This time it's gene called SOX9. Here's the start. Then there's all the sequences that specify the protein of SOX9. And then there's the stop signal. And upstream of that, again, is this regulatory element. Okay, now what's going on? This is a map of the Y chromosome, male chromosome, defines the male. And there's a gene, it's been known, this has been known for some time, gene called SRY. And SRY gene is turned on in the first few days of the embryo development. And in the very early de embryo development, there's a, I could call it a primitive structure, which can, which has, has is called, is called bipotential. It can subsequently differentiate, it can go down one path and forms the testes, or it goes down the other path and forms the ovary. And what causes that to happen? What happens is that early on, around about day four, day five, embryo development, SR, sorry, week four, not day four, week four, SR, SRY begins to be switched on, produces a protein. And that protein acts on the gene for SOX9. It actually acts on that regulator, the piece that turns up the heat on the genome, makes it start to send out lots of message, create lots of protein. And what happens is that when SRY acts on the SOX9 gene, the message goes out and that primitive structure develops at about nine weeks into testes. If the embryo is female, that is XX, then there is no Y chromosome, there's no SRY, SRY protein being produced, so SOX9 is sort of quiescent. And at about 14 weeks, if there's been no signal coming in to SOX9, then that bipotential or primitive organ then develops into ovaries. So that's simple human development, right? What this group in Australia did was they studied some individuals who were intersex. And that's been known for a long time that there can be individuals who exhibit both male and female sexual characteristics. Just think back to Greek mythology. The Greek god Hermes married Aphrodite. Their son was called Aphroditus, uh, Herm Hermaphroditus. 
and there are depictions of hermaphroditus as having male and female sex characteristics, and of course you have the term now, hem a hermaphrodite. Okay, so the, the Australians were looking at a very small number of individuals they had access to who were classified as intersex. And we'll start off with those whose chromosomes were XX. So they were chromosomally, you'd say they were females, yet they had developed testes. What was going on? What they found was with this SOX9 gene, the, the regulator upstream had been duplicated. There were several, many copies of it. So without the need for SRY, that SOX9 gene got turned on. The heat got turned up, it started to put output, and that sent the signal for that primitive organ to develop into testes in a person who was chromosomally, we would have said, was female. Now they looked at males who had ovaries. So these were people who were XY, so we'd say they were males, but yet they had ovaries. And what they found was in those people, that upstream regulator had been deleted. So although SRY protein was produced, it had nowhere to go. It couldn't find the SOX gene to bind to it and start turning up the heat. And in the absence of SOX9 being produced, eventually that primitive organ developed into ovaries in somebody who was XY. So that was complicated. Why do I tell you that? I tell you that because in the binary world of our president, where it's I win, you lose, deal or no deal, sexual characteristics are a heck of a lot more com complicated than simply being a binary system of whether or not you have a Y chromosome as these other factors involved. And that's just for the anatomical piece. Now you think about transgender and what's going on in terms of psychology and emotion and, and sensitivities and so on that make people identify as being transgender. And I think, you know, it's just this, this binary thinking that, well, you're either male or you're female based on these chromosomes is just totally out of the window. And this just shows for something as simple as anatomy of the complexity of the human genome system and how these interactions can occur and make life difficult. Okay. So while our current president and his administration is looking to assign people, you know, you get signed your gender at birth and that's it. And by the way, with some of these intersex characteristics, they're not necessarily apparent at birth they may only become apparent at puberty. So you're assigned a gender at birth based on sexual appearance at that stage, and it can change over time. So the first piece uh, back in uh, August of last year was a report that Germany, and this I think is probably a copy of a German passport, and we all have our passports, and it says on our passport whether we're male or female. Germany is uh, introducing the option to have a third category. I don't know what, they'll have a letter I or something like that for intersex on their official government documents on your passport. And for those of you who came today across the Connecticut River, your state of Vermont is gonna roll out on your driver license the option of having a third category, X. Uh, I think that's moving its way through the legislative process right now. So there are some who see that it's beyond just being a simple binary system. Okay, still with Donald Trump, but now we have Elizabeth Warren, right? Uh, I think we all know uh, about Elizabeth Warren and Trump taunting her, take the spit test. Well, remember what the issue was? So Warren has said that there's just family law, that in her, on her mother's side, there was Native American ancestry. And she tells the story, if you go to her website, you'll find a lot of this information on her current uh, election website or presidential candidate website, um, that her father-to-be, when dating her mother-to-be, when they were courting, he was told by his family, oh, you can't marry that woman, she's got in Indian blood. Uh, but he defied his uh, family and he married. 
But that's the law in uh, Warren's uh, family. She denies that she ever played the card of I'm a minority when she was applying for her various academic positions. And again, on her website, you'll see a whole raft of people that are there speaking from the various academic institutions where she worked over the years, and all of them saying she, this issue of her being of Native American ancestry never came up. But she is listed on Harvard Law yearbook uh, for 2012 as being Native American, and that's what our president got upset about and baited her and said, take the test. And I, as I recall, he said, if you take the test and you prove that you've got Native ancestry, I'll pay, a, give a million dollars to charity. She took the test and he's denied all, <laughs> all of doing that. So um, let's take a quick sidestep for a minute. This is one map, one person's view of the way in which humans moved out of Africa and spread across the world. This is probably changing every day. This is from a book uh, by a chap called David Reich. It's quite a nice read, actually. Um, the main thrust is that uh, humans emerged from Africa around about uh, 50 to 80,000 years ago, and they either spread west into, uh, into the Middle East and then on into Europe, or they went east into Asia. And at some point during the uh, last glaciation period, you were able to walk from Russia across to Alaska. So they crossed the Bering Strait on foot. And the native peoples there were there around about 15 to 20,000 years ago. Reich believes that they stayed in this area till about 12,000 years ago and then began the migration all the way down to the southern tip of South America. People have looked at these uh, the, the, the DNA of these native peoples. And there are very clearly unique clusters of DNA sequence which I, I identify and separate out the uh, Native American people from people, for example, of European ancestry. So Elizabeth Warren had her test done. And um, top here is this Carlos Bustamante. He's a genetics professor at Stanford University. He did the test for her and said very clearly that with high confidence you could see she has some Native American sequences in her DNA. But there are such, have been modified to such extent that it's probably now six to ten generations back. But they're there. There's something there for sure. Then we have the response from Chuck Hoskin, who is the Secretary of State for the, I didn't know that the Native uh, tribes had Secretary of State positions, but they do. And he said that a DNA test does not lay claim to any connection with any Native American tribe, but he was thinking, particularly speaking for his, the Cherokees. Um, it, it's just wrong, it's just inappropriate. So, on the quiz, the first question was, Elizabeth Warren is a Native American, true or false? So what do you think? Is she really Native American or isn't she? Both. Both, okay. Why both? She had Native, I mean, we talked about her having Native. Well, I could say I'm um, because they, maybe 1% of me came from Norway and Scotland, but who knows? Right, but does that make you a Viking? No. <laughs> I probably got the same as well. Have you got the Viking grip where your hands turn in over there? That's the Viking grip. Yeah, that's where you're gripping your sword. Okay. Well, um, this is. Oh, this is what the press said about it all when it was announced. You know, she stands by a test, but this is going to be an issue when she runs for sure. You can bet your life that our president, when he runs for re-election, will pick up on this one. Um, she, she's, she's sticking by it. This is for a, an academic at University of Connecticut, and you can see what she says here. Identity and belonging are socially, politically, legally, and culturally determined. It's not about your DNA, but it's about all these other softer factors that make you 
a part of a Native American tribe or not. Go. How does Dartmouth determine that when they decide the tuition because it's lower for Native Americans? So that it's a percentage? I have no idea. That's a good question. You could, we could go and ask Dartmouth that. Is it? Yeah, sorry, Margaret? Yeah. An eighth, okay, yeah, yeah. And so, and they just do it based on sort of classical paper-drawn family trees. I guess. Yeah. yeah. My daughter's grandfather was Choctaw Subnation of the Cherokees, and he might have been an eighth. But by law, my daughter and her mom and Chris, they're they're too diluted to be. Right. My grandfather was born in uh, Ireland, so I can claim an Irish passport, but I wouldn't really claim to be an Irish person. But that, that's the way they've drawn up the law. And I think you know, it's up to each of these nations, these uh, Native American nations, to make up their own decision as to who should be considered part of their tribes or not. Yeah? Well, 2%, yeah. Absolutely we are. Absolutely we are. We all originated in Africa. Uh, my take on it, for what it's worth, is rather a simple conclusion. Stay away from heritage and don't rise to the bait. You're never going to win with that person. Okay, moving away from uh, dictators to China, um, we saw a little bit of this, this northwest region of China, Xinjiang, where there is a very high Muslim uh, population called the Uyghurs, who have been set upon by the native Han Chinese, as it were, to be discriminated against. They blame them for a series of terrorist attacks. There certainly were terrorist attacks, whether it was the entire Uyghur nation that was uh, responsible, we could very much doubt. But they have been rounding these people up. They've been collecting DNA samples and other biometric, like iris, you know, retina scans, uh, iris scans. Um, they've been putting them into re-education camps. And um, the government just says that the DNA testing, oh, it's just for crime fighting purposes. Well, when this uh, came about, um, it came out that US company Thermo Fisher Scientific was involved. Could you pull the door to somebody, please? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, Th Thermo Fisher make the gene sequences. They've been supplying them to, um, to the Chinese Ministry of Public Security. This is a quote from their 2017 annual report. Our greatest success story in emerging uh, uh, markets continues to be China. They have been minting money in China by selling them these gene sequencing uh, machines, when it came out that they were being used in a way that people like Human Rights Watch and these other groups say is really discriminatory and uh, against the Uyghur nation and is really taking away their human rights. Thermo Fisher have actually backed out of the market and are not now supplying them to China. We also have a couple of academics, Kenneth Kidd with a very fine moustache there uh, from Yale who's been providing consulting services to the Chinese on, this pop on the issue of population DNA and what it looks like. And another chap, Bruce Budoli, from the University of North Texas, have been involved as well as a consultant to the Chinese government on all of this. So the question I asked was, well, could this happen here at home in some way? I mean, we talked about this, how safe is our DNA? Turns out there's a database called Alfred, and if you look at the address, you'll see, oh yeah, that's in, at Yale University, that's Kenneth Kidd. That's his database, and it's called Alfred because it's allele frequency database. What it's got is, according to the New York Times, is they got data from over 700 different populations in this database. So they could take your DNA and match you up to a particular population. Could they? 
well, this is just an academic exercise, right? This guy is an academic at Yale University. I mean, why should we be worried about it? No? Well, when you go to the, date, when you go to the website, the first thing you see is that Alfred is supported by the US National Institute of Justice. Who's heard of the US National Institute of Justice? Well, guess what? It's part of the Department of Justice. It's a research and development agency for law enforcement and criminal justice pr practitioners. And they're interested in DNA and our individual DNA. OK. That's all we have on Ancestry. And Ian, is it worth talking at all about, and does it fit in here anywhere, the issue of who can or may have designer babies and how that affects the world? Who can have designer babies? Yeah, using gene technology. Right. Um, Is that what we're talking about? Uh, if, if you, I mean, what I presented to you there was what's the state of re regulation? One guy has defied the regulation that exists in his own country right. and has created them, and everybody is now up in arms. What can be done? I mean, if people have got ideas, I'm sure the academics. Oh, the Jennifer Doudners and the others who have been very much involved in this are, are really seeking solutions to this problem because there's broad agreement in the scientific community that creating designer babies. And I know Professor He said, you know, this is just to make children disease-free or prevent or protect them from the risk of disease, but he's totally against doing gene editing for the basis of intelligence or height or hair color or eye color or anything like that. No, we'll take him at his word. He's genuinely you know, concerned about these families and their, need, their desire to have children. Um, I don't know what the answer is. How, how is this going to be managed on a global basis? What we saw, just to give you the example, was again this, this issue of women who could not, could not have babies going to term because their mitochondria which are the sort of the energy factories inside your cell, their, their DNA was defective. And frequently, when you have a child uh, conceived, you will, you, that will uh, be a miscarriage. It will not go to term. So what people have come up with was the idea of taking in vitro fertilization of the regular mother's egg, the father's sperm. You get the uh, fertilized egg, you extract the nucleus and put it into the cell of a third donor which will have healthy mitochondria in it and then you've got the basis for taking a baby to term. And this was, this was, uh, came to the attention of the FDA and they said, whoa, you can't do that, you know, that, that, that's an experiment, you need to have a permission to do that. So the physician who was offering this said, right, we'll go to Mexico. It's allowed in Mexico. And off he went with a, with a prospective family. And they did the procedure in Mexico, quite blatantly. I mean, he said, we're going to Mexico to do this. And if anybody else wants to follow me, you know, I'll do it for you in Mexico. So you know, it's, it's that simple, just to go and cross the border and uh, operate somewhere else. Yes, Steve. Anybody want to make a stab at that? Yeah. Joan. We don't know the side effects. <clears throat> right now, we don't know the side effects. But, but let's say technology. Right. We do. Absolutely. That's one of the things that scientists are saying is we're not saying we should ban this forever, but we've got to get to the first step, which is to understand the safety of this, then the accuracy, the fidelity of this gene editing. In fact, if you've heard about CRISPR, you know that it has a handle on it. It's called CRISPR-Cas9. And Cas9 is the enzyme that actually does the, the DNA snipping. And now there's a whole series of these enzymes, Cas 
13 and CASP 6 and so on, and they're trying different ones and to see which ones might give higher fidelity overall. So yes, in years to come, the academics agree, we will get to a point where we do fully understand the safety risks. But here's another thing, and we don't know this for all cases, but why are there people walking around today who um, have sickle cell anemia? First of all, what causes sickle cell anemia? It's a single gene mutation, give you a clue, right? Why are they still walking around with sickle cell anemia? Because where it arose in Africa, if you had sickle cell anemia, you were resistant to malaria, and you didn't die of malaria. So it actually conferred a selective advantage on you. Now, who knows all these other genes that people might think about engineering, and I know you're uh, example, you know, the, uh, of cystic fibrosis might be right at the end of an extreme where you say there, there's got to be no downside to trying to improve that person's life. Um, but, you know, if you start tinkering around with some other genes, do they confer some hidden advantage that we don't know about yet? That's, that's another area of concern. I, I suspect that we will get to a point where it will become uh, acceptable in regulated countries to do gene editing on an embryo for certain uh, conditions, leth otherwise lethal conditions, I mean a child born with cystic fibrosis, absent the recent startling advance by the way in therapies now, you know the lifespan was really uh, limited and the quality of life was very low. So in Britain they have the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority I think it's called, which regulates all uh, in vitro fertilization techniques, all the clinics that do it, and, uh, and, and says what is permissible and what isn't, even in terms of screening embryos for genetic defects to say which ones should be rejected. So that's in a sort of reasonably sophisticated culture in Britain, um, and, and maybe in the US, rather than having just voluntary guidelines, eventually there may be regulation. But there are going to be lots of places in the world you could travel to and uh, you know, just get whatever you want. Don? I'm wondering if there isn't also a, a, the question of design, who gets to have designer babies, if there isn't a flip side of if you're one of those people that has a disease that can be cured, but it costs half a million dollars, it's sort of like you're being relegated basically to a lower class life forever because you're not likely, if you're a regular person, to have a half a million dollars or a million dollars. So it's like kind of like being born into the wrong cast. Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, Medicare for all aside, um, yeah, it, it, it could be, you can look at it the other way as well. Those that can afford to get gene editing will establish themselves, you know, as being a superior cast. I mean, especially if it gets beyond just gene editing out a gene which is for a lethal condition but then becomes a gene which might enhance intelligence or athletic prowess or anything else, you know? Yeah, I didn't mean about so much whether it can help people, but who is it, who is it gonna help at what cost? It would be a good thing to figure out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think you need to look at the long-term changes too because these people are gonna have offspring. Right, it, it will be in the germline it will continue from generation to generation to generation. That's why you've got to be very careful before we go any, into any of this to really be sure we understand what's happening when we start to tinker with the, uh, with the human genome and change it, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, we've got, only got about uh, 10 minutes left. Uh, let's do a quick bit of recognition. There's been a lot in the press recently, I don't know how many people might have noticed this, that there's a growing awareness of the fact that many women who were scientists or engineers or whatever never got the recognition that they deserved. Did anybody see that movie, Hidden Figures? A great movie that was. And there's lots of other examples out there now of women who, uh, I think there was a piece in the Valley News recently of Joshua Lederberg and his wife. Of New, York, New York Times. Yeah. So I'm rather pleased as I put this together. I didn't do this deliberately. The women outnumber the men two to one in this category for the, the, the year that's gone by. So isn't that great? 
So let's just see what some of the people have been recognized. Uh, I sent you around the um, article by Amber Dance. Uh, she's a, a bio reporter uh, talking about genetics and, and social issues and so on. She got an award from the Hastings Center for her work. This one on the right is terrific, this beautiful young woman from Saudi Arabia. She is the first person from Saudi Arabia, and she's a female, and she's a geneticist who has been awarded a Rhodes Scholarship to study it and get a degree at Oxford University in the UK. So great for her. Um, the Kavli Prize, I think it's one of these prizes where they try to anticipate who's going to get a Nobel Prize. They want to get in ahead, you know, and establish some some kudos for themselves for anticipating. So here we have uh, Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudner. They work very closely together. They're two of the best known figures in the earlier work on CRISPR gene editing. This other chap, Virginia Jus, uh, I won't even try to produce his, pronounce his last name. He comes from Lithuania. Not well known, but apparently he was a very early pioneer in this work as well. So they got awarded for their work on CRISPR. And by vote of the British people, there's Rosalind Franklin. Rosalind Franklin produced this first photograph of X-ray crystal structure of DNA. And it was this photograph and the data around it that allowed uh, James Watson and Francis Crick to have correctly modeled the structure of DNA and give rise to their paper on the 25th of April, 1953. Watson and Crick and Rosalind Franklin's laboratory leader, Morris Wilkins, were all awarded the Nobel Prize. The reason she didn't was because, tragically, she died before the Nobel Prize was awarded, and it's not given posthumously to anyone. So the British people, the, the Brits are developing this rover, which is going to be sent up to Mars to look for signs of life. And they thought it was appropriate to put her, attach her name to that Mars rover. So if you got uh, that a Mars rover was named in her name uh, on the pop quiz, well done. That, that's that one. Um, Nobel Prize in Chemistry. Now, Nobel Prizes are awarded quite some time after the event, but I chose to put this up anyway. Uh, these two gentlemen on the left here got it for something called phage display. It's a genetic technique for t expressing human proteins on the outside of bacterial viruses and is a way to generate a rapidly a whole range, a whole diversity of antibodies. And chap on the right, Gregory Winter, established his own company in the UK and they developed this little antibody which they sold off to a pharmaceutical company in the United States which is now selling for $18 billion a year. This these, these people, uh, he, Winter's company, developed Humera. Uh, Francis Arnold, again, it's work that was done quite a while ago, but on what's called directed evolution of enzymes. The idea that you can use biological systems for chemical synthesis by modifying, forcing the enzymes to adapt to a more complex environment was work done by her. And we're seeing, as I showed you a little bit earlier now, producing, for example, uh, cannabidiol in baker's yeast. So this is the sort of thing that she did. Uh, Nature's had top 10 scientists. Uh, Barbara Ray Ventner, she was the lady behind the tracking down of the Golden State Killer. She was the sort of consultant to the FBI who gave them the direction as to how to go about actually tracking him down. Viviane Sloan, we met, she was the one who found the child who was the offspring of the Neanderthals and the Denisovans. And uh, of course, Professor He and his uh, CRISPR edit uh, edited babies. Um, the science breakthrough of the year is single cell sequencing, which I know Steve is uh, very fond of, and the analogy that you gave about this, right? Do you remember what that was? So gene sequencing, you have to take a a bunch of tissue, right? And you break it down, you extract the DNA, and you sequence it. What, uh, Steve doesn't remember this now, but what, the analogy that was given was like trying to make a, first of all, making a banana, mango, strawberry smoothie, and then trying to find the strawberry in it. <laughs> it's all mixed in together. If you take a bunch of tissue, and especially, for example, if you take a tumor, these are dynamic changing systems and mutations are occurring. What this now allows you to do is to look at individual cells 
and they give just three sort of scenarios of the sort of work that could be done. You can look at the individual changes that occur as cells go through this process of embryo development and have genes get switched off and others get switched on and so on and so forth. The emergence of new mutations in cancer and um, the diversity. You know, you, you think about your lungs as being your lungs, but there's a whole different range of cell types in there doing different functions, and you can look at the individual cells to see what their functions are. My award for the scientist's chutzpah of the year was the idea of sequencing the entire world of species, over 1.5 million species, and I su suspect that's an undercount. There's probably that many insects in the world, or arthropods at least. Anyway, it's only going to cost 4.7 billion, so if you want to add to the collection, I'm sure they'll be pleased to receive that from you. Okay. Um, I think with the, ex what haven't we done? We haven't done bioterrorism. One quick, that, that should be relatively short. Um, each year, I th you've probably seen it on the TV, you get the men in suits and the generals, you know, with all the ribbons and the, and, and the medals sitting in front of the House Intelligence Committee and the Senate committees or whatever, and they deliver this worldwide threat assessment uh, from the uh, Office of the Director of National Intelligence. And this year, they listed their threats, and they say that it's not necessarily in order of importance, but by golly, when you're making a list, you do put the most important thing at the top. So top of the list was cybersecurity, not surprising, followed by influence operations, and third was weapons of mass destruction. And within that, that statement about biological weapons uh, becoming a bigger threat as the technologies emerge that can just are available to anyone to use now. As I said earlier, you go to YouTube and you'll see young adults doing CRISPR experiments in the kitchen. It really is that easy. So, this is a real risk. Um, New York Times said, uh, talked about New, uh, North Korea, and by the way, it looks like there's been a bioterrorism attack on his hair, uh, for goodness sake. Um, you know, the assessment is that North Korea is actually developing this technology. There's a few pieces of evidence to suggest that might be the case. How reliable they are is hard to say. Uh, there's some evidence that they've been reaching out to foreign researchers to get the technology in. They've certainly got a fairly sophisticated, sophisticated fermentation set up in the background here. They're not short of dollars to buy sophisticated equipment. Uh, defectors, and how reliable are defectors as witnesses, but they're talking about uh, seeing the testing of biological agents on some of the uh, the political prisoners in the many, many political prisoners that exist in the camps in North Korea. And they also talked about the fact that they, doing blood testing on some of the defectors, they detected antibodies to smallpox. And that I find very weak evidence because, first of all, if they're old, the chances are perhaps high that they had a smallpox vaccine at one point anyway. I did, for sure. I'm sure a number of you have got smallpox vaccines. And secondly, we know that during the Korean War, there was actually smallpox circulating in North Korea at the time, and maybe they got exposed. So, we don't know. It's not something that our president wants to bring up, apparently, with, with, with President Kim, um, but that's you know, a potential threat. So, the question is, what's our government doing about it? Well, first of all, they are, go to the National Academy of Sciences, and they get all the academics together, and they look at what the threats, the risks are. There's a couple of publications out there. If you just go to the National Academy of Sciences website, you can find these available for download, talking about dual-use uh, technologies. So a year ago in our class, we saw a group of academics in Canada at the University of Alberta. They ordered by mail order a whole series of DNA sequences you can only make them in the DNA machines so long. So if you want to make a long piece of DNA, you break it up into sections and you get DNA sequences. So they ordered a whole bunch of DNA sequences online from a company that makes it in a machine and ships it off to you. And they assembled it to make something called horsepox virus, which is related quite closely to smallpox virus. Now, the sequence for smallpox virus, I could give you the reference in the scientific literature in the journal Virology, 
for the sequence of smallpox virus. It's out there. If the Canadian researchers can spend $100,000 and about six months of work and create horsepox, it ain't going to be too difficult for some trained uh, molecular biologist who's now of a particular persuasion to have a go at trying to make smallpox virus. That's what we mean now about these dual uses. They, they, are, they are pervasive and they can be used in a number of ways. The other one was talking about biodefense uh, possibilities in this age. And so let's look at what our favorite friends at DARPA are doing. And I say favorite friends because I actually did work on a DARPA project involved in biodefense at one time. They've come up with a new program. And what I find interesting about this is because of what we've talked about before, they are looking to be able to switch genes, they say, on to boost protection, but it may also be, in my view, also switching certain genes off to protect an individual in the event of exposure to a biological agent. They've got a number of uh, examples that they're going to use, influenza, opioid overdose, organic poisoning, and gamma radiation. The reason why I say switched off is if you go back to 1918 and the Spanish flu, a lot of the people who died were younger, apparently healthy, robust people. It wasn't the old folks like me, but it was the young folks. And what we think they were dying of was what's called in the scientific literature a cytokine storm, which was really just a huge overexpression of the immune system, of the immune response. And it was their own immune response which killed them, not the influenza per se, not in the way that we think influenza, you know, you end up with pneumonia and in the hospital and all the rest of it. These people, their immune responses. Now, if we can get to those regulatory elements that are upstream of the genes and find ways to dial that thing down, for example, um, you might be uh, being able to have prevented those people dying from cytokine storm. So I think that this sort of program, whether it achieves DARPA's goals, and after all, what's DARPA given us? It's given us the internet, which everybody uses. It's given us pretty close to now autonomous vehicles, which we're getting close to having access to. I'm not sure that the stealth um, uh, technology for ships and airplanes are going to be particularly useful to us. But, you know, uh, these sort of things have spillover effects. And the idea that in the future, some of our medicine may be actually regulating the genes by getting that regulatory element and turning it up or turning it down, I find really quite intriguing. And uh, so there might be some good stuff coming out of that. The other group that you've never heard of is the Intelligence Advanced Research Projects Activity. And what they're looking at is, um, other than making fun names for their programs, is coming up with um, some artificial intelligence approaches. For example, if they see a DNA sequence out there, they can scan it and see is that related to something that might be dangerous because it's related to a bacterium or a virus like smallpox. And so they've got a number of these artificial intelligence estimates that are going on. OK, it is 25 to 6. Our time is really over. I think I'd like to draw a, an end to that, but if you've got any more, one more, few more questions, we can just do that. I think we're running out of battery on the, <laughs> on the camera as well. What's the answer to number two? Oh, number two. Well, come on then. Who said, hands up now, who said that the, of all those three billion bases, only 1.5% uh, codes for genes? Hands up those who thought 1.5%. Okay, a few. Who thought 26.2%? Okay, and who thought 71.3%? 1.5%. What the heck does that other 98.5% do? Well, we've seen two things that it does. We've seen that there are these regulatory elements which may be duplicated and triplicated in those intersex individuals. We've seen that they code for those micro RNAs, which clip the messenger RNA and break it apart so that it doesn't code the proteins. And we will find out a lot more about what that other 98% does. And if you're interested, we can do this again next year and just see how much further we got. Thank you.